three percent. Okay, uh, listen, they are not they they are not active in India, right? So yeah, so it's not an active strategic point. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm not sure how much you guys will say. <laughs> it's not tough. But let's, let's, let's go ahead and see. So, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, you should, you should really think about whether you have to do another round of talking to the VCs. Because there are so many more VCs now, and there were, you know, even three years ago. But uh, do, do, uh, which VC do you think? Uh, no, I, listen, I don't know the education department sector well, but like I'll tell you the process I would use is go list any VC that did a deal that is in the education sector the last, let's say, 24 months, okay? And just make that list, then talk to Satish or where can you get a really good intro? So not cold calling them won't work, that okay? Uh, where can one of these guys, either Sridhar, you know, uh, or, or, or Satish will get you an intro, right? Or where you know somebody yourself. And then go and call them. This is the only way you know if somebody is interested is if you ask. If you don't ask and you just assume the answer is no, the answer is no. <laughs> it's like, because so you just got to go out there and you never know. Because there are enough people and you've got enough traction, you may have to package up these deals, make it attractive. Uh, come up with a story that maybe hides this off. Is there somebody you can sell this business to? Uh, and still keep some of the IP to build a... <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Good. Here's my card anyway. Yeah. Uh, 
Basically, I'm the founder of Tommy Jams. Uh, we are a startup where we get artists and venues together. Sure. So it's a marketplace where different uh, bands, musicians, DJs can be booked by venues like bars, clubs, gadgets, sure. concerts, festivals. Uh, so basically, we've been running, uh, we expanded from Bangalore to seven cities in India. Then we went to outside to start up Chile uh, to expand into South America. How was that experience? Yeah. So the experience was nice, but the market is very different. We still have traction and it's breaking even in South America. Correct. Right. But uh, we don't have a very profitable, like, as in it's, I think, like, it was, yeah, as in, it's just bit breaking even the currently. So we expanded to uh, Santiago, uh, Buenos Aires, and Argentina, and we have traction from Mexico City, uh, and other parts of Mexico as well. And uh, so currently we have around 2,500 bands from different parts of the world. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of international acts. We have some presence in U.S. as well and Europe as well. Uh, more so our concentration is mostly India, a little bit South America, like decent amount of South, South, South America, like the Spanish market, and uh, parts of Europe and U.S. We haven't diluted anything yet, so it's like it's 100% with us. Uh, and we've been proper prosper since uh, month month one, like month one, yeah. one, month one of every generation. How big is the team? It's still two of you? Uh, it's six of us. Six, okay. Yeah. But okay. Uh, like two of them are part-time, like they, they work as business development because they've already been in the music industry and two, two of them Got are it. permanent. Got it. So we still lo run almost like a lifestyle business with a product and technology and we've been doing that for two and a half years since. Got it. Uh, but we, like as in, so the, the confidence in us is that we haven't, uh, so because we, we don't run into losses, we know that we'll be able to, like we can survive like this for a longer time as well. And our clients are good in like Phoenix, uh, Art Rock Cafe, Ritz Carlton, Taj Palace. And so, so like that way we are just like pretty stable there. there. But when it comes to uh, really making us very scalable, disruptive product, we're still like on the way to like back funding and do that kind of a thing. Right. We haven't done that yet. The question like today was that we recently got an interest uh, f uh, for a buyout. Like as in, we, like I'm not sure what the interest, like as in what level. Like it's, it's come from a very close person in Bangalore. Uh, so the the question I wanted to ask was that how do you divide a company? Uh, like it, it, we've been around only for two and a half years, and there are multiple uh, ways in which you can buy out. Uh, in terms of like some people outsource the uh, only the intellectual property, some people uh, give out the uh, like only the technology or uh, technology with the team. So what is so the buyer interested in? So I, uh, the buyer is basically into similar space. They they started from the school side where uh, where they they started. Uh, they, they had their own studio where dance acts used to come in and they expanded and they recently I think have a like the, the person from the US is that they're getting an accelerator rated thing this so the founder is also started an accelerator which is which is kind of getting a 30 million uh, fund funding so from there they have an interest and in, I was just talking to him and he told me that there would be an interest like uh, like uh, just tell me a little more about so I told him uh, and like so we have a very good camaraderie between ourselves. But I just wanted to know, uh, like, in case, like, so we have a few options as to one, take it on as lifestyle businesses because we're doing pretty right, well. That, that you're already doing, right? Yeah, uh, right. one That's is. Steady state. Yeah. That is for lifestyle business. Yeah, and scaling as well, I right, think, right. slowly and gradually. Uh, one is uh, take a funding and uh, take a funding and go to disruptive phase Got if it. we can. Uh, and the third is, like, uh, now we understand the market as well very well. Uh, Book My Show is founder uh, also Huge. approached. Yeah. Yeah. So he also uh, approached us at some point, and they're get, get, they're getting a one million dollar fund, like uh, fund for themselves to actually fund a couple of fund uh, companies okay. in different space. So like we have some you? interest. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> so it is a out of the box solution, no customization required. It's a one size fits all. So why not say that? Oh, correct. So you will say it's flexible, fully configurable. But why not just say it is a specialized ERP for schools or educational institutions and that's it, one yeah, sentence. Yeah, so what is your USP? Oh, okay. But in India, people don't mind customization. No, they don't. That is true. <laughs> Little bit. But I want you to come install. I mean, I don't really care whether you configure or not. But I will just sit there and wait for you to come and install the box for me. Because I don't have somebody like her to do it for me. So I'll just sit there and wait.
Yeah. No, they don't. But I'm saying whether your product, whatever your product is, the customer remains the same with the same demands. So in your case, it's just that your customization is really easy for you to do because your product is configurable. But I wouldn't sell it saying it is, you know, out of the box, do it yourself. Because in India, the only guys who do it yourself are really small organizations. And even people like me don't like Salesforce because they said you have to install it yourself. So we actually had a workshop from one guy who we bartered conference tickets with for a free workshop on Salesforce. And then we said, you install it, he's like, oh, that minimum deal size is 5 lakhs. We're like, are you nuts? Why would we buy Salesforce and then pay you to install? But we would have paid like 50k for someone to just set up Salesforce for us. Even though you're right, it's self-configurable, but who wants to do it? We still don't want to. No? Still don't want to. It's easy enough, but see, nobody's responsibility to do it. Nobody's skill set to do it. You'll pay a small amount of money just to have this fellow come and do it for you. But then you grow, obviously. For example, you know, like SAP and colleagues guys don't do it. Correct. Yeah. No, but they have a consultant army who will come and do it for you. You will hire somebody like her to do it for you. So anyway, so that was just complexity. I just found that the way you had written your descriptions, um, like hers was easy enough to understand. I figured out what she did. But for the rest, it's like you could have brought so long is a different issue. The networks so, of the angel investors and the investors didn't come in and that kind of got them into the right places and the right visibility and all. Yeah, 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 it happens. No doubt it happens. But you know, that's exactly the timing is all important. I mean, it's very, very important in different issues. So, it does happen. I mean, I have seen ventures which uh, need money day after tomorrow and they're coming and pitching to us today. I mean, there is no way, there's literally no way you can take a decision and put in money day after tomorrow. I mean, the fastest uh, investor, if anybody says, I saw the pitch today and I. Uh, Invest it tomorrow, I don't believe it, honestly. I mean, what is the key factor? term sheet, you want to do a diligence. Even if you don't do a diligence, I mean, just the, the act of getting money to you, you want to think about it. At what stage of the startup journey you would like to talk? You would like to start talking? We come free revenue. What are the key factors which you look into any startup? Oh, I look at just three factors, and in that order. I look at a kick-ass team. For me, the team has to be literally the best team on God's earth to do that business. Yeah. The second is really how large a market is it hitting. If it's hitting just a small niche market, not interested because we are not, we as investors are not investing in the companies which you get dividend returns. We are looking at getting fair valuation going up and exiting on that. Game. And the third, I think, is how innovative or how differentiated is that product. Yeah, so now it's just been word of mouth. Actually. Try marketplaces like these Elancy type places, Elance, Fiverr. That's where all these guys are hanging around looking for, you know, the decentish size techie programmer thing. Wouldn't they also be looking? I mean, they may be desperate by then, right? All marketplaces, so does Flipkart suffer from the same thing, non-serious clientele, <laughs> universal problem. <laughs> no, but see, any marketing is about finding a group of people that you can talk to cheaply. If you have tons of money, you can talk to larger groups of people, diffuse it. But at your levels of growth, you would want to find catchment areas. So that is also why people like D2B, because then you can find a cluster of clients within one organization is what you hope and that's why you look at B2B. But if you're looking at a cluster of B2Bs, the only place you'll find them is like um, in a trade organization. So if you say I want to contact all members of the IT Association of America, there are schemes for you to do that. Or you say I want to target all buyers of SMD Weekly or subscribers of some site, that is possible to do. In your case, obviously a guy who reads ETs you know, share price section is interested in some fashion. So you would go at places where those guys congregate. It could be just a Facebook group that discusses shares or discusses tech or any of the above. But you have to start identifying that. You also would probably say that, look, if I have to meet this year's targets, 
I need 100 sales of this sort or I need 1000 sales of that sort and then you go after that small number of sales that you really need. So again a lot of people say oh my god I need to do so much of marketing when actually like for these two guys I would assume that one Great Lakes or one Amity or one ISB would pretty much meet your target vis-a-vis -vis chasing 10 smaller institutions. So then you might say that look let me look at five of these guys and see what I can do to win just one of them. Right? And because see, bandwidth is the issue. So we can talk about someone who's doing D2B and D2C and at the same time or architecture and PMO at the same time, but it's really hard to find the bandwidth for it. So first is to say, okay, I do this one thing, this is my value prop, then this is where my potential buyers are congregating, let me go chase them. Somebody like her who has a little more money will then expand and say, look, guys who are likely to be relocating will be hanging around airports, so maybe I want to do a billboard campaign only at airports. Uh, chances are that an expat listens to an English radio channel, so in the two, three places there are English radio channels, maybe I sponsor, you know, something on traveling or something like that. So as your budget expands, you will expand your areas of talking, but initially you would start looking for small clusters, where you would find, you know, like a startup event would probably work for you, a startup event. Like any, you know. It did, I think. Uh, hmm. It's been five years in business now, so I think the first two years we went to a lot of startup events, so that's where I would find entrepreneurs who were interested in getting okay. into services. So I think now, um, you want to do that same thing in the US also. So, uh, and they have a whole ecosystem for that. Right. Also, maybe talking to angel investors would help so that they find a founder with a business guy. Yeah, so you could be on retainer with one of them, like a Sequoia or someone if they gave you a deal, then you'll get their portfolio funds to advise. So again, it's a good cluster. Yeah. So uh, one question hmm. is, uh, is uh, for example, for us getting clients right now is not very difficult. We have some of them already on board. Uh, for us, the thing is enough because that is family because I'm going to take And the problem is now, as I'm hiding, I've tried with two folks who've done MBAs in US, not been able to sell it by them. You know, Mr. Azim Trenji still does sales calls. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You guys are not going to get out of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so they've asked to be yeah. yeah. So, he's been guiding us in okay. marketing. So, uh, now the challenge is that as you get more, so the story has to be specialized and yeah. passed on to people. Yeah. So, how do you reduce, you talked about complexity to reduce. So, anything you could share on how to reduce complexity, get a very simple story in this actually works. Which is the same thing, right? If you can answer the question of why someone should buy you and not someone else, then you start building out the point. So if you say that, okay, they should come to you because you're the only something, then you need to have a substantiation for that. So to answer your question on awards and all that, so if you say that I am the only person in India who does this, I need an award which says that I am the only person in India which does this. Right? So whether it is good or bad, it has to say that language, otherwise it's not worth it. Or if you say that my quality standards are higher than XYZ and that's why you have to buy me, you have to get a certification stating that your quality standards. So you talked about transparency. I don't know who's certifying that you're more transparent. So if you get a certification from some transparency organization which says, yes, sir, these guys truly are neutral and don't bias, then it's a point where now Thai, of course, is, uh, Thai Delhi is very, very active. Uh, they've got now their own property, so we built up that PNL. Operationalized Indian Venture Capital Association, uh, got a few tax pass through for the VC, lobbied, so understood that ecosystem. We found a trustee of um, NASCOM Foundation. So when the tsunami hit, we said we had to do something, right? So got that going. Then I got bored with all of this while I was doing my corporate life. Then I realized, you know, we were bought by the Brits and the Brits are very Brit. So if I had to talk to my boss in London, he said, Two, two weeks later, I'll give you time to do a five-minute call. I said, doesn't work for me. So I stepped out, didn't know what to do, and then this whole angel thing started. So I co-founded Angel, Indian Angel Network. First few months, I thought, two hours a day, ho jayega, kuch na kuch. you know, we'll see. It was like a game, like a hobby. You know, karna hai karo, mat karna hai. I mean, there were no targets. Nobody gave me anything to do. Then I realized, hey, hold on, this is a model which if we put in some effort, it could work. 
So the good thing is that there were a lot of angel uh, groups working overseas. No, there was no there was no example here in India. We were the first, right? So we did a copy paste and we failed. And then we had to make 90 degree turns. See, the entrepreneur ecosystem there is very, very different, much more mature. Investors accept failure. Um, Expectations. Very, uh, yeah, they're much more, uh, they have a better support system, you know, getting grants, getting incubators. Here, incubators today may have improved a little, but when we started, incubators were realistic. Uh, literally, you know, it was a conduit for academic institutions to take get more grant money from the government. That was it. There's nothing happening there. Right? So there was nothing breeding as entrepreneurship or innovation. I mean, if you look at it, it's only in the last five years that you start hearing about innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah. Right? So I think we grew. First year, we thought we'll do one deal. We did two. First year, we thought we'll have 15 investors. We had 30. Next year, then the Bombay people said, we want to bring it to Bombay. Then the Bangalore people said, let's take it to Bangalore. Then now, before I know it, we have it in six cities here. Every Saturday we have pitch sessions. Then last year, Cameron invited us to London, so we launched in London from number 10. Now we realize that we are Asia's largest. We realize we are the world's only angel group which has international operations. So we give us 350, 350 so up from 10 countries. So we are flying in money all the time, flying out money from exits. We've got a hundred company portfolio. We've hit returns which are interesting. So without knowing, actually with a blink of an eye, I think it's just happened. I'm enjoying myself. I'm rocking. <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> I think it's a. I think it's a effort of a lot of people. It's not one person. But it's interesting. I think. I think the biggest learning for me is keep trying something new. Something will work, something won't. But if you don't try, nothing will ever work. So I think that to me, is keep going. And keep, I think, belay your age. That's my learning in life, truly. The day you think about age, you've aged. <laughs> Just two things, I would say. First of all, entrepreneurship is very difficult. Everybody around you recognizes that. And it can become very lonely and depressing journey. I think always look for the positive. Because what if there is a dark side, there has to be a light side. There is no way, no way that there is. Look for that. Because that inspires you to take the next step. Because if you look at the dark side, you're always going to be inspired to take a step back, right. which doesn't work. And I think the second thing is create the venture for because you want to create it, not because you want to raise money, not because for any other reason. You really want to do this. Put your heart, soul, mind, body, everything into that venture. If that passion is not there, if that commitment is not there, it's not going to work. Whether money comes or not, that's all secondary. I think, and I think a lot of investments we've made has been, uh, this is Dosa guy, right? I mean, you talk to him, he'll tell you, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. The minute you talk to him about the machine or Dosa making machine, he's a different person completely. He's taken over. You have no airspace with him. That passion. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, I have to do this. And then this happened. And then this happened. And then this, he said this, and then I did this, and then you know I did this, and then this happened, and then the BBC guy came and he, she said this, and I thought this was a, hello, I didn't ask all this. <laughs> but he has, he's so involved. Yeah, that's what, yeah. yeah. And then you ask him, when are you getting married? I don't know. <laughs> you know? Very good.
ladies and gentlemen, would request you to wrap up this mentor session in the next two minutes. Okay, so with this, uh, we are going to call an end to this one-on-one -on -one mentoring session. Uh, I hope all of you all had a good informative uh, chat with your mentors. I'm uh, going to request all our mentors to come up on stage and accept a small token of appreciation on our behalf. So the 14 mentors can please come up on stage. I can see Piyush is walking up towards the stage, all the other mentors as well.
break at this point. Uh, you can help yourselves to some uh, tea and snacks, and we'll come back for the presentations in just a while. So the tea is right here. We're going to take a 10-minute break exactly. Uh, get recharged, and you don't want to miss the next part of this session. 4:30. We're back with you, and this is all live on YouTube. So if you can make yourselves available in exactly 10 minutes, please. changes every day. CNBC TV 18's Young Turks Conclave 2015 celebrates the disruptors who are pushing boundaries, breaking the mold, and changing the way we do business with their bold new strategies. This July in New Delhi. In partnership with Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Titan, your time has come. decades of experience dedicated minds working together serving the needs of millions of customers the latest in technology and pioneering innovation to put the very best investment choices at your fingertips anywhere anytime cidirect.com leadership at work for you we live in an age of disruption where breaking the rules means building them. Rebels are the new heroes. Where the game changes every day. CNBC TV 18's Young Turks Conclave 2015 celebrates the disruptors who are pushing boundaries, breaking the mold, and changing the way we do business with their bold new strategies. This July in New Delhi. In partnership with Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Titan, your time has come. ICIC Securities and all your rules. And what do you think about today? No, actually, I've never got a chance to say thank you. For what? Oh, sir, so when I was quitting, I just said that it's the best decision of your life. So? दो साल में खुद की इतनी सक्सेसफुल कंपनी खड़ी कर दी हम नी पीपल कैन डू दिस यार अच्छा तुम कोई सीईओ ढूंढ रहे थे ना सीईओ हां ओ या ऑफ कोर्स या सीईओ मिला है कोई बट आई नेवर हायर्ड अ सीईओ बिफोर सो आई डोंट नो हाउ सिंपल मीट हिम एंड टेल हिम यू आर द गाय फॉर द जॉब रियली या देन यू आर द गाय फॉर द जॉब सर हम ready for an unmatched automotive experience overdrive at these times we live in an age of disruption where breaking the rules means building them where rebels are the new heroes where the game changes every day 
CNBC TV 18's Young Turks Conclave 2015. Celebrate the disruptors who are pushing boundaries, breaking the mold, and changing the way we do business with their bold new strategies. This July in New Delhi. From the business of business to the moves in the market, from the policy prescriptions to the day's top newsmakers, Tune into the award-winning India Business Hour for your daily dose of news, views, and analysis. India Business Hour, the show India has watched for more than a decade. This is the award-winning India Business Hour, India's most comprehensive business news show. And it's only on CNBC TV 18. At these times, only on CNBC TV 18. We are focusing on developing India's defense industry. This is why it is at the heart of our Make in India program. Within two years, the interest in the defense sector has gone up tremendously. India has allowed 49%, but it has said that you can go to 100% in cases of modernization and state of the art. Engaged in a frank discussion with Larkin and Dubrow. It will be an Indian company with Airbus technology. Dynamatic Technologies, that is a medium-sized industry. Our skills with them have been fantastic. Everything that's going on uh, at the policy level, at the government level, the opportunities are very large. We live in an age of disruption, where breaking the rules means building them. Where rebels are the new heroes. Where the game changes every day. CNBC TV 18's Young Turks Conclave 2015. Celebrate the disruptors who are pushing boundaries, breaking the mold, and changing the way we do business with their bold new strategies. This July in New Delhi. In partnership with Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Titans, your time has come. ICICI Securities and OU Rules. From IT hubs to manufacturing giants, South India has been a major driver of the Indian economy. With exclusive news, speeches, interviews and reports, CNBC TV 18 takes a closer look at southern India. Catch up south. Throughout the day, only on CNBC TV 18. All of us have access to the same numbers, almost the same information. That is how we interpret them that makes the difference. Our editors are recognized experts in their own field. And that's why key policy makers, caliber experts want to speak on this channel. Companies talk to us because we understand their businesses and we ask questions that matter. Actionable information delivered in real time accurately is what CNBC TV 18 is all about. We live in an age of disruption where breaking the rules means building them. Where rebels are the new heroes where the game changes every day. CNBC TV 18's Young Turks Conclave 2015 celebrates the disruptors who are pushing boundaries, breaking the mold, and changing the way we do business with their bold new strategies. This July in New Delhi. In partnership with Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Titans, your time has come. OU Rooms. OU Rooms are changing the way India stays away from home. We give you rooms starting at $9.99 per night. Yep, you heard it right. That's cheaper than a box of cashew nuts from a five-star minibar. Now, that's just nuts. Did you say quality? You'll be blown away by our standards. Our rooms are awesome. Clean rooms you can lounge in, ACs you can cool down with, spotless linen you can snuggle with, cozy beds you can sink into and sparkling bathrooms you can turn the heat up in. We are thrilled to offer you a comfortable, no-frills stay. You're thinking no-frills means no perks, right? 
Oh well, not with us. Perk up your morning with a complimentary Oyo breakfast because we are generous like that. And did we mention the free Wi-Fi from the comfort of your room? Also, 24/7 reservation is just a call away. Plus, anytime room service with our trained and friendly staff at your convenience. CCTV cameras monitor all the common areas and hey, our enemies are the same as yours. So come on, stop paying for the frills. Sauna, spa, swimming pool, fancy restaurants. Huh, who has the time for that anyway? It's time you checked into an Oyo with more than 500 hotels across India. There's an Oyo near all prominent landmarks and we are multiplying fast, right? Call now to book your room and remember, stay awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, may we request you to please take your seats. You can bring your tea and coffee with you onto your tables. We need to start as we're live on YouTube, First Post and MoneyControl.com. I would request all of you to please take your seats. Gentlemen, this is the second. As we are live across three digital platforms, we would request. I'm going to request everyone to please uh, take a seat. We need to get things going.
going to ask everyone to sit down uh, in an hour or so after we've finished uh, this part of the session. We are going to have a longer networking and break so you guys can catch up then. If all of you can please uh, take a seat now. So thank you very much. I hope all of you all had an interesting and insightful first session. Uh, this part of the program will actually have presentations and small talks by some of our mentors on topics ranging from branding and building culture and hiring to uh, some facts and hard truths about fundraising. But be before we begin this, I'm going to invite CNBC TV 18 managing editor and the force and heart behind Young Turks for the last 14 years, Shireen Bhan to come up and open this session with a small address. Thank you very much, Saina. And good evening once again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to all our Young Turks and our Young Turks mentors for joining us here at the Young Turks Conclave as we celebrate 14 years of being India's longest running show on entrepreneurship. Now, over the years, uh, through diligent observation, I have come to realize that good entrepreneurs are ordinary people who make extraordinary choices. They're not fearless, but they know how to fight their fears and not give in to them. They're not selfless, but they have the good sense to think beyond themselves. They are sore losers, but the defeat that they face makes them try twice as hard. They're sure of themselves, but the really good ones have the ability to listen. They're proud, but not too proud to acknowledge a mistake and course correct. They're neutral to both high praise and to criticism. They have the ability to be self-sufficient, but they also know how to carry a team along. But entrepreneurship, ladies and gentlemen, can often be a lonely battle, especially as you build and scale. It is in those dark sometimes desperate moments, or even in exhilarating moments when the company grows at a scorching pace that you feel the need for a shoulder. Someone who will tell you to take chances, but also be straight enough to tell you when to cut your losses. Someone who will believe in the magic that you're capable of, even when you don't believe in it yourself. Someone who will celebrate your success, but also tell you if you're being delusional. In our quest to find such shoulders, Young Turks is proud to present the Young Turks Mentor Program, which you've witnessed here this afternoon, an inspiring group of men and women who've put their money where their mouth is. So once again, congratulations to our 43 startups for being the first batch of the Young Turks Mentors Program, and to our 14 mentors who've given us their time and encouraged this program and have helped us nurture the startup ecosystem in India. Well, before we proceed with this evening, let me just tell you what you're going to witness here today is for the benefit of everybody who's taken the time to be with us here for the mentoring sessions. We thought it would also be nice to give everybody the opportunity to get a slice of the conversations that were happening around you, not on the table that you were on, but around you as well. So we thought it would be nice to hear from everyone who was on different tables. Uh, this, of course, as I pointed out, is going live on YouTube. It's going live on First Post and on moneycontrol.com. Hashtag YoungTax14 or YT Conclave, and we'd like you to tweet your thoughts, your comments, and suggestions. Your feedback is always welcome. Before we go any further, uh, you are going to hear more from our speakers this evening, but then later, starting 6.30 this evening, we've got another star-spangled lineup for you. We've got the former CEO of Globe, uh, Vodafone uh, PLC, Arun Sareen. We've got Neeraj Kakar of Hector Beverages, the brand uh, paper boat that you're all very well aware of. We've got Shine Mystery of Teach for India. We've got AIB in the house, and we will also be joined by Abhishek Bachchan. So stay on with us for that session as well. But first up, uh, let's kick things off with our mentoring program. And Saina, it's back to you. Thank you very much, Shireen. Uh, the first speaker that we have uh, up today is uh, someone who
who doesn't like text messages. He's just begun to WhatsApp. Uh, he says that uh, he wishes to publish his book of poems sometime very soon. He is the executive chairman and national creative director of ONM India, Piyush Pandey, on what it takes to brand a startup. Well, good evening, all. I hope you're having a ball out here. And thank you, Saina for selecting me as the first guy for what you said is going to be small talk. <laughs> nice. I like it. <laughs> okay. Um, I think all you interesting people, all you people of tomorrow, all future of this country, I wish you a wonderful, wonderful session today. And I'll draw a quick parallel between your lives and mine. And I, I'm going to talk to you about six P's. Now, these are not the four P's of marketing that you have read about. These P's are different. Um, I think the first two, and the parallels between what all you are doing, I cannot change your product. All of you, somebody is selling lingerie to middle-aged women. Somebody is doing all kinds of wonderful things. I can't change that. But what I want to share with you is the first two P's to me is product and passion. Whatever product you're making, make it with passion. In my case, my product is communication. And I have tried from the days when I was your age to try and make sure that my product is made with passion. My product is not compromised at any point of time. And if I was to leave you with the first two P's, its product and passion never, never, ever compromise. Never scrounge on those two things. Put in what you have, and I'll show you one piece of work, which I'm very proud of, as a result of product and passion. So, Ashish, my friend, can you play one piece of work? Draw parallels from my life. compromise a little bit on this. I was talking to the group of young people at my table, and I said, all of you as startups are probably going to communicate on the digital format. And my suggestion is, you'll save a lot of money going on to digital. Never, ever compromise on the product and the content of what you're putting. Spend money there. Only then you will make a difference. So product and passion are the first two P's that I want to talk to you about. I think lots of you must have started alone, or two people, or three people. And as the years go by, you will have more people. And my third P is people. When I was first time made the creative director at Ogilvy, Mumbai, my boss called me up and said, you don't know everything. You know the master picture. Surround yourself with people who know things that you don't know. Surround yourself with crazy people. Surround yourself with people who challenge you. Surround yourself with people that your admin guy comes and says, this guy comes late. And you can turn around and say, do you ever find out what time does he go home? So people, people, people as you grow. And I have Thank you. 
change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world
need an actionable plan. My first realization was that when you take uh, any idea, it can be taken to a closer, but it's always good to have a lot of mentors and information uh, from people who have done it. Because when I started, I did not anticipate how much time and how much fund will that venture require. Uh, however, I think with the uh, weekend and uh, limited budget, we were able to launch that product. And then, uh, uh, piloted in many uh, retail and corporates. Uh, the second business idea which many people know is Jabong. That's on a very different set. Uh, good traction, initial set of investment, pilot money already approved of. A very different uh, game which became very popular uh, immediately because it was uh, cash rich. Uh, then we also did uh, ventures in supply chain a logistics company and an art company. And the realization is that each venture, uh, though there are very common themes, has to be treated very differently. And the second part is, the first part is you have an idea but you don't want to act or you have found some way to convince your mind that it has to be delayed. So act now and find a way to do it, even if it's on weekend. Uh, it can be done. There are enough examples where it has been done. The second part is once you have acted on the idea, how do you scale it up? Now that's a tricky part. There is no uh, one solution which I'll share and it will work for everyone. But what has worked is, as Fuse shared, I think the two Ps I'm very, very, uh, uh, so it start with, probably it starts with one or two individuals. So the third P, which is people, comes later. Passion and product, uh, I, I strongly believe, are very, very critical uh, when you do that. Uh, so I think the first idea was with limited budget. So you have to be very specific in terms of what product have you created and how are you going to target the customers. You don't have enough resources to be capital inefficient or to have a uh, CLV return of two years. So CLV return of two years is I, I get a customer at a cost and he comes four times in two years and then he makes me profitable. So those concepts will not be applicable if you are constrained with budget. Created or what differentiation have you created? Is it is the delta enough to convert an existing big corporates to you? What is the price at which you are providing that value? So it is a least marketing cost effort, but the maximum effort goes in terms of creating that product and service 
and then persistent uh, with the customers to at least help them pilot it once, not even try at a large scale, but pilot them once, showcase what you have created, and then you can win. The last, uh, I will say, it's, it's not highly scalable today, which is Anasha Art. Now, Anasha Art does sales in, I would say, slightly uh, high price points. It cannot afford a mass media marketing uh, where your audience is very targeted. It's very niche, and uh, one of my uh, mentees had similar ideas. So once you have a niche uh, product or a service, you have to think of a very different approach to reach the target audience. Uh, I might not be the right guy, probably Piyush might be, but uh, you are the best person to know your c customers, where do they go and how do you target them. And uh, that's the approach to follow. So I just shared these three initiatives because I kept uh, getting uh, uh, during the interaction as well and also on uh, uh, social networks that I have started, uh, the first part is that they have started. So I get that I have started my venture, but I'm struggling to scale. So the first success is that you have started. That's a great news. Out of 1,000, only one does that. 1,000 people have ideas, but finally one actually executes. Now the second part, scale up, is even tricky. Uh, and whenever someone comes with an idea, I say, idea is difficult part. The most difficult part is execution, and the biggest difficulty will be to get money, either from customers or from investors. Today, from uh, investors, it's getting easier. We are in the right time zone. So I think you should start fast and raise fund. Uh, the investors' sentiments are really, really high. They really believe in the new generation and the concept that they have brought in. Uh, so a good time to start. Uh, and the last part I would share is uh, there are enough uh, online mechanisms uh, which are very capital efficient. So you can be very, very targeted with limited budget. So don't uh, start comparing that someone has raised 1 million, 10 million, and 50 million. How do I compete? Uh, the good part is that with that kind of money, people generally become inefficient. So you are in better position to build the right culture and build the right targeting to create a very sustainable business model. So money is not the only differentiator to win. I think the team and the product is the biggest differentiator. Uh, that will be my message. Thank you. So thank you, Praveen, for that. Next up, we have uh, someone who until December 2013 was heading up engineering and sales DP at Flipkart, which is India's largest e-commerce portal. Uh, he, since December 2013, has been heading up the people's function. That's no mean task because at about 33 or 34 years of age, he's overseeing 33,000 people with an average age of about 26 years. Uh, he says he's an eternal optimist. When I read that, I thought, yeah, to be managing that kind of scale, you have to be an optimist. Mekin Maheshwari, very happy to have you here. Thank you, Saina, for the opportunity. Uh, it's sad to not see Piyush in the audience. Uh, he delivered magic and ran away. Uh, and it's a, it's a tough act to follow. Uh, I'm going to talk about the third P that he spoke about, which is people. Uh, yeah, that, but do keep in mind that this is an engineer talking about people. Uh, it's uh, trying, trying to bring some science, some engineering to thinking about people. So let me, let me start with, uh, again, questions I had on the table and things I hear most uh, when I'm working with startups around people. Uh, I think, so the most important job, right, when you are, when you're trying to build, when you're trying to build a company uh, is to get, to get three stakeholders to believe in you. Uh, Praveen talked about two of them, uh, customers and investors, third is employees. Uh, Getting them to believe in you, as in you are a, you're a, you're somebody with a crazy idea. It is about craziness. Otherwise, you're not going to change the world. Uh, now, getting people to believe in your vision uh, is tough, and and that's super important. That if they don't believe in the vision, uh, then what you are getting on board, and if you think about them as 
as somebody who's here to do a job, what you're creating is not necessarily going to last. What you're creating is not necessarily a startup that's going to build towards the future. So ensuring that the core team that you build, uh, your first few hires, and keep that, keep that bar of passion, keep that bar of commitment uh, super high. I have to admit that it's gotten much, much tougher today. Uh, so while convincing investors has become easier, convincing employees has become much tougher thanks to the competition, thanks to the boom that we are seeing in Indian internet and the technology space. Uh, but do not negotiate on that. Don't negotiate on commitment, as in somebody who's coming in uh, for a few hours, for a few, nah. It's, building a startup is about a lot of passion, is a lot about commitment. They have to be partners in crime. They have to believe in your vision as much as you do, probably more, and probably challenge you, and push forth, right? So think of it as getting partners on board, and ensure you're not, you're not just getting somebody to do a job for you. Uh, don't hire Java developers, right? <laughs> As in, if, if that is what you're looking for, get somebody else to do that job for you, right? Outsource. Uh, but if you're getting, if you're taking responsibility of an employee coming on board, they are sacrificing the most important years of their career to your vision, uh, right? Take accountability and ensure that what you create is great. Uh, so, and this takes a lot of effort. As in, selling a vision, pitching to people, uh, convincing them about what you're trying to do takes a lot of effort. Uh, when I was building the engineering organization, and I think the reason Satran Vini asked me to step into HR when we had that open up, was I was spending close to 50% of my time in hiring, right? Which means if it meant going and speaking to somebody in their cafeteria about the vision that I had about Flipkart, so be it, right? So whatever it takes uh, to ensure that people get to understand the vision, and whether it is about training interviewers around hey, what we want to evaluate for is problem solving, not puzzles. As in awareness and knowledge is not going, to f not going to help create. We need creators, and for people to be able to create, they need to be able to think and problem solve. So test for that. And how do you test for that? Because if I were to ask 10 people in this room to figure out, okay, how will you evaluate for this? I will get very, very different answers. Ensuring that people understand that, hey, this is what problem solving is, and this is the way we can evaluate it, is super important. I think as an entrepreneur, what you bring to the table are your beliefs. You have a belief that this is what customers are going to buy. You have a belief around what kind of an organization is going to work in the future. If you've not thought about it, think about it. As, in, as, an, as an entrepreneur, you're actually creating an organization as well. You're creating a business, but you're also creating an organization. And that organization stands for some things. Those are your beliefs. As in, you might have a belief that hard work is everything. Do not compromise on it. Right? So when you're hiring, definitely don't compromise on your beliefs. And ensure that, hey, you test for those beliefs when you're hiring them. Because eventually, the, the company you build is going to be a reflection of your beliefs. Uh, culture in most organizations are shadows of the leaders. Uh, the customer centricity that Flipkart has comes from Sachin's paranoia and passion around every small customer problem. And it, you're going to define that for your company. So ensure that you have clarity on what are your beliefs, and ensure that hey, they get evaluated. Don't compromise on that either. Uh, some things that in startups, I believe, are important to evaluate for, uh, from the fact that most of us don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, and definitely what one year away is going to look like. Ability to adapt and learn is critical. Uh, for that to happen, you need people with humility. Right. If you get people who are like, I know everything, sab janta hai, domain expert, the ability for them or the possibility of them adopting, possibility of them changing as the world around them changes, and our worlds are changing very rapidly, uh, is super low. So test for humility, test for ability and willingness to learn. That somebody might have the ability, but I'm not willing. It's like, I'm done learning, uh, in which case they may not be the best fit for startups. Uh, they might be great fit at other organizations adding value and doing a specific job. But for your partners in a startup, get people who have that sense of humility and are hungry to learn, are curious uh, about figuring out life. Uh, okay, another thing, another thing that a lot of people ask me is about, okay, how do you create culture in an organization? You don't create culture. Culture gets created. Culture is, some, culture is how a place operates. 
right? Just how do things happen? And how do things happen gets defined as the first employee of your startup by you, right? The way you do things is how others are going to start doing things. Uh, and the simplest of examples is you walk into a new coffee shop, you don't necessarily, there aren't elaborate boards key, say this place is self-service, please go there, order here, pay the money here. There aren't detailed instructions. You just observe that this is what people are doing and you do that. So when somebody walks into your door as an employee, they see what you are doing and they start doing that, right? So the biggest definer of culture is an entrepreneur's actions. The largest actions you take, it is, I mean, the kind of people you hire, the kind of titles, the amount of money they confer, and you might want to believe that, hey, these should be confidential and secret. There's nothing like that. As in, uh, these, these get discussed so openly in our nation that you would actually want to be proactive about communication and as transparent as possible, uh, rather than catching people by surprise. Uh, that, hey, you were the senior most person on the technology team, and we found this new person. He's coming on board. He's going to help us go forward. Let that not be a shock to somebody. Let that be somebody that comes from your mouth, uh, right? So, and the way you run the organization is going to define the culture. As in, you surprise people, people are going to surprise you back. Uh, so, it depends on what kind of an organization you want to build. I think the, yeah, I think the last thing I want to talk about is culture needs to be in sync with business strategy, right? So, if you are, if you are building a company, or if you, if the idea that you are building on requires massive amount of focus on quality that it's like, hey, it's a robotics arm that's going to operate inside an engine and fix things where the cost of an error is going to be many lives. Uh, then you need to inculcate that in terms of culture as quality. Uh, and so culture can't be separated out from business. Culture and business or culture and business strategy go hand in hand and ensure that, hey, so Flipkart has a culture of experimentation, and that's, and that's super critical for what our ambition is. And if our ambition is to try things out and go after scale, and we, we are completely sure that, hey, we don't know everything about e-commerce, we're gonna learn as we go, that culture of experimentation becomes super critical. So ensure that your strategy and your culture talk to each other. Uh, you can't have them be separated out. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot, Nikhil. Um, I'm Megha Vishwanath. I will be taking the session forward from here. Hope you've had a very fruitful session. Our next guest is someone who's a seasoned entrepreneur and an investor. Uh, she has her expertise in consumer internet and technology, having served as a mentor to many startups, CEO and co-founder of Let's Venture, Shanti Mohan, will take us through some of the hard facts <laughs> opportunity to come up here. So first is I'm going to bust some of the myths which have happened already where people said it's easy to raise money. At the angel stage, I mean, I'm the founder of a platform called Lex Venture and we see a lot of startups come online trying to connect to investors and raise their angel round. And, uh, you know, they asked me to talk about the hard truths of, of, of raising money. So I thought I have to be brutally honest in, in what we've been seeing for the last two years. So, <clears throat> How do I? Okay. So one thing we always tell entrepreneurs, right? So don't make fundraising the goal of why you started a startup. Because I think there's too much of hype, too much of press coverage when startups go and raise their funding. And I see a lot of time entrepreneurs come up to us and they say, you know, I have this awesome idea and I want to raise like $1 million. And we say that, you know, probably there are a lot more players in the space now. So he said, okay, probably I'll go and think of some other idea, right? So that's not the way you build a business. So when you start a venture, I mean, this has been talked about by the last three speakers who came here, right? You have to have passion. You have to have belief in what you're trying to build. I think that remains the fundamental truth of 
being an entrepreneur, right? And fundraising should be incidental to how you build your business. It should be just one of the milestones you kind of go, go past when you're trying to build a venture, right? So it cannot be the reason why you're building the venture. Right? And um, so, you know, the second thing is, you know, fundraising is an ongoing sales process, right? So it is like, how you would approach a customer, right? You have to kind of approach fundraising in a very similar way. And we see most of the successful startups who kind of manage to raise money well from well-known investors, from actually easily, and have had a good experience there, have actually treated it just like how they would try to win over a customer. So it's, so you actually build your relationships, you kind of you know, start working with people, and then when people start liking what you're doing, they start getting engaged with you, it's much easier to go ahead and then close your fundraise process, right? So it is an ongoing sales process in terms of how you would approach fundraising for your startup. So I actually thought I had 10 minutes, so I made like nine points on how you should go about it, so I'm just going to kind of run through it. Um, so the, the third, I think the more important, at least in the Indian ecosystem, which I think is very healthy and very good, is that traction is not overrated, right? In the sense that you have to have, you have to, you have to, you know, have good amount of traction. But at an angel stage, I think angel investors do understand that if you have a proof of concept, you have a prototype done, you have some validation in the market, you are able to go and go and kind of raise your angel round, right? And this is again based on my experience of, of having talked to so many startups on the platform. We've helped about 36 startups raise their angel round. We've seen the amount of angel investing, the median hours going up. So initially about in early 2014, we actually saw startups trying to, good startups trying to raise about 1.5 crores, right? Now we see that number going to about three crores. I'm actually seeing that move up further. It's actually going up to four crores, six crores, right? But at the end of the day, it is, it is traction which talks about your business, right? In, in the sense that you have to have a good customer validation if you want to get the valuation at the right point. You want to kind of, again, get good investors on board. You want to build a good business. So, you know, don't assume that since you have the next best big idea, you are going to be able to raise $1 million. It actually only happens if you've already built a flip cart or you've already, you know, you've already kind of already uh, been a successful entrepreneur, then your track record talks for itself. But if you're a first time entrepreneur, you have to show your ability to execute, build traction, right? In fact, we had a startup, I remember, which came to us and he was trying to raise 1 million. And he said, I, am, I want to raise 1 million because I'm building this insurance insurance online and uh, we are like you know what is your differentiator he said because i have the domain name insure.in i was like clearly this guy does not understand how the web works and you know no if anybody looks for insurance he's going to find me so you know this is like the best idea i know so many insurance companies in my in my in my local area right so clearly that's not how you go about building a business I think this was already talked about by, by everybody, again, about people, right? I really believe this, and I see this happening in every deal, right? All things being the same, right? Like if a startup has got the same traction, they are working in the same, same place, as an investor, the, the final decision actually bases on when I like the team, right? When I like the people, because we all know that angel investment is super high risk. Right? So it's almost like play money for all investors, right? So they write the check, and we always recommend that you forget you wrote the check because you may not see that money come back. But you would be happy writing a check to someone you liked because you believe that he put in all he, all he needed to kind of build that venture, and you're happy to support that entrepreneur, and you're not feeling bitter about having lost that money because you actually liked the team, you kind of believed in what they were trying to do. So this kind of comes back again to the same point of the four P's we talked about, passion, people, it kind of runs consistently across every, every activity which happens in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Right? So for, for, in fact, we had a deal which was going on where this was like a hot startup, it just kind of happened on Let's Venture. And he was trying to raise about, you know, like about uh, half a million. Then he saw huge traction coming in from investors, so he raised his amount to much higher, 
And what he did is that all investors who came after that initial initial half a million were actually given a 20, they were actually asked to give a 25% premium. So it was like a, a, a very, very hot deal, right? While the paperwork was closing, there were a couple of investors who dropped out. And there were people waiting to get into that deal. And there were a couple of investors said, I don't want to be part of this anymore because I don't like the entrepreneur anymore. I think he's losing his modesty and humility as he's seeing a lot more interest coming in to his startup, right? So the end of the day, we want to work with people we like and that also holds true, true for entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs say, I don't want to take money from him because I don't like the way he asks me questions. So it, it kind of works both ways. It's not that only the investor has to like you. I think as an entrepreneur, you must like the people who are putting money into you because entrepreneurship is not an easy journey. And in fact, I was just writing this blog on my way to Delhi on, on the flight where, you know, people only see the person at the peak putting the flag when he's kind of trekked up the mountain, right? They don't see the days and nights which went into climbing that mountain. And entrepreneurship is very similar to that, right? People don't know the sleepless nights you spend, the, you know, the stress you go through when you're not able to think about how to pay the next paycheck, right? There, is, there are a lot of stressful moments in the life of an entrepreneur. And you certainly want your investors on the same side of the table, right? Because there are much bigger bigger challenges to conquer, you have markets to win, you have competitors to beat, right? You don't want to be internally not working with people whom you don't like, right? So this holds good for entrepreneurs and for investors. So, you know, timing is, timing is really important on when you want to raise money for your startup, right? So always plan ahead, have enough money in the bank when you're trying to fundraise because at times, fundraising won't go the way you want it to go, right? Because again, you know, at the end of the day, the, uh, the, uh, the, the act of the investor writing a check to you actually is, is, is very, very gut driven, right? So there is, there is no complete logic and data supporting an investment, right? At the end of the day, you have to like the team, you have to believe in something, this is going to become big, you have to, you ha there is a lot of undefined metrics there, right? So you want to ensure that you have enough money to kind of take you through that journey so you don't go and make mistakes while you're, uh, while you're making your fundraise. Right? So we always tell entrepreneurs, you know, have, make sure that your timing is important. So timing is important in terms of you having money in the bank and also about not going too early in your product cycle to raise money. You have to be closer to product market fit or have to have that belief that what you're building is going to scale. Right? So you want to make sure that even in terms of building your business, you're at the right time when you kind of try to go raise money. Um, sorry. Okay, so be persistent. I think this was the last uh, P which Piyush talked about, right? So you, that also goes through for fundraise, right? So I have heard of, you know, I am also, we, we kind of went through our own fundraise at Let's Venture. And sometimes there are days when when you know when you have one believer and then there will be five people who will tell you no right and you have to continue to believe in what you do and just be persistent you have to know that you have to be able to find the next person whom you who actually believes in what you're trying to do so you have to be persistent and i have again you know when when i kind of talk to entrepreneurs i can completely empathize with them because i have kind of gone through that process i'm building let's venture as a venture from an entrepreneur's perspective Right, not from an investor's perspective, right? So it is, it is about being persistent in your journey when you want to kind of go raise money. Um, I think this is like the, this is like a P which I would say is so underrated at times, right? So we see entrepreneurs not even wanting to spend time on their investor deck right, when they want to raise like $1 million. I'm like, if you don't want to spend that time preparing, thinking through answers, thinking through how you want to present it, you know, take every part of fundraising seriously, right, because you want to make the other person feel like you actually did your homework, you actually know about him when you went to the pitch, right, so prepare well when you go and do a fund, because like I said, right, it just seems very easy, because there is so much of coverage of, of funding in the press, right, but for every startup which raises money, there are 10 which are not able to raise money, right? So you have to make sure that you are putting your best foot forward in terms of, you know, preparing, 
for your fundraise process right so ensure and you know we have this we have this kind of guideline we tell people so pick up your list of 10 investors pick the top 3 whom you think you know it's good to get their money but they probably are the not the more and most important then you have the second category where you want to get their money it's kind of really good the third is the people you really want the money from go to them the last right you actually got a lot of questions asked by other people so always do mock runs dry runs we always encourage entrepreneurs to do dry runs with us just so that you are more prepared and you are more kind of focused when you're going to go for your fundraise so this is like this is like one of the most key things right you have to be honest about your venture you know when you try like i have i have actually again i mean we are trying to raise our next round for let's venture and a lot of people say you know show me your exit plans and if i don't know my exit plans you know i can always talk through my exit plan i can be a very good speaker i can go pick up a lot of stuff but you have to talk about things you believe in because in the next 5 minutes when they ask you the next question you will not be able to honestly defend what you're what you're trying to say right so somewhere you have to be honest that you that you don't have every answer to every question being asked to you that you're trying to find the answer i think what you can be honest about is that you're passionate and you will find a way to get to that answer but at that point of time you may not have answers in fact there was one article i had read where they had asked an investor for all things being the same right what would what is the one thing which which if it happens you will not write the check right but that is not the only reason why you write the check and the investor said it is ethics that is entrepreneur does not have ethics i cannot write a check to him i don't care about anything else after that right so just being honest about where you are in your venture is probably one of the key things when you kind of go fundraise i don't know it's going reverse so you know there is no entitlement in fundraising i think that is so important and i keep hearing this all the time but why does that investor not want to write a check to me it's the angel investor's own personal money he has he can write it to whomever he wants to write it to i think there is no entitlement here right just because the other startup raised 1 million at 20% or whatever right whatever dilution right i want the same it does not happen because you do not understand what went behind that startup right what is the what is the founder thinking what what are his what is his vision what does he want to do so don't compare yourself right just try to do what you think is best for your venture because i don't believe in this and and i and i hear this so much and sometimes i think we stop to think as entrepreneurs that you know the angel investor is probably our first support system when we want to build a venture right so he is writing his own personal money he is not even using somebody else's money or managing a fund to write checks to you right so i think your i think one thing is that you cannot assume entitlement when you kind of go fundraise so i hope this was not like the most uh, you know <laughs> uh, bursting the myth kind of thing on fundraising but you know this is what i have seen at let's venture through my two years and you know it has been it has been a great journey and it's not as hard as it sounds here it is easy but just that these are just some small pointers which i thought i should bring out on the fundraise process thank you well just to put uh, things in perspective what shanti was saying when we opened registrations for yt mentor we saw over 70% of startups registering for the fundraising table well that clearly says something taking stage now is someone who clearly has one of the longest and the most interesting linkedin profiles i have come across a serial entrepreneur with five ventures and two public exits angel investor startup mentor and chairperson of nascom product council ravi gururaj is a man with many titles to his credit one but one passion entrepreneurship ravi let's welcome him with a long long round of applause please welcome the man who is the most passionate man of your life slides so you know i just set this up uh i'm often asked by young entrepreneurs so what do you put in a pitch and i figured you know i was in one event where uh entrepreneur got up on stage and challenged me to put together a pitch 
He said, okay, you know, you have to smile, you keep saying, keep it on the nine slides, uh, you know, try it. And we spent the next hour, a few mentors, putting together a pitch to show them, you know, you could just literally try and compress a, a good story uh, in nine slides, right? And that's what I'm going to try to present here. It's completely locked. It's uh, almost possible. But ignore that and watch the theme, right? And, you know, I'd like to do a poll at the end. If anybody's interested in investing, you can applaud, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, so now the concept here is I'm, I'm picking out of the investors. So, you know, it's music book. And so I'm going to start now. I'm going to go into a role play. And it's going to be about transforming this music industry, right? So, thank you for taking this meeting. Uh, I'm going to present to you a really industry transformative opportunity. I am going to redefine how the music industry works, and that's my goal. So what is it? What is fundamental about music? Music is fundamental to our lives. All of us are listening to music all the time. And what we're going to do at Music Book is connect people with the things, the events, and the people around them. And so let me tell you what Music Book does. So our secret sauce is IoT is in, 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 in the mix now. You're wearing Fitbits. You're wearing all kinds of devices. We're going to be able to measure your pulse rate. We're going to be able to tell where you are. We know from your calendar what you're doing. We know what mood you're in for what music. And we're going to play the right music to you from your library. We know what kind of activity you're doing. Are you in the car? Are you about to go into an important meeting? Do you need some zen live music? That's the, the, the music player we're creating. So, you know, it's only been possible today because of big data analytics, IoT sensors that we have, the ability to stream music on demand from the cloud, and you know the devices you're carrying around that are ubiquitous and in your hand all the time, right? So that's what Music Book is fundamentally about. You know, we've got a great bio user acquisition uh, model because you know I know you hear this all the time, and you know entrepreneurs always try to hand wave how they're going to go get users, but we truly believe. This one will be so transformative that you know people will refer their friends and they'll be telling their colleagues about it and it'll be buzzing around town. And we have evidence, early evidence to show that that's actually going to happen when we when we release this technology. You know, we're going to do all the low-cost marketing, all the above building we can do, uh, and you know we're going to try and keep the cost of that acquiring that initial base really low, but then hope the viral effect takes hold. And you know that's important. I know a lot of you all say, how does the viral effect take hold? Well, what, how did WhatsApp take hold? How did Spotify grow? A whole bunch of other things. How are they growing? It is there. It is an important element. And what it is, is are you really delivering value? And so we believe our marketing campaign will be quite low in cost and very effective. Is this a big industry? I'm sure that's a big question we had. Okay, great, well, you convinced us, you know, about the product and there's some secret sauce there it's worth looking into. But is this really big? And it truly is. Sure, we can't upset the, the Apple Music Store. We can't take down the Google Store. That's not our plan. It's actually to provide those serendipitous moments for music you've already purchased. It's already on your device. But to bring it together in a, in a way that is going to delight the user. That's our plan. And we're going out with that long tail. You know, we will extract, you know, lots of value from the various niches. You know, this is a cliche term, I understand. But, you know, that's where we believe the long tail is. The long tail of value that we're going to go out and capture. Huge market. Music just is exploding. Music then transforms into video. And, you know, the, the, the market doesn't see it, right, uh, in terms of its growth rates. We have super type of financials. I'd be glad to dive into this with you later. Let's not bother about this night right now. As you can presume, if we're successful in getting that initial base going, we're going to be a hugely profitable business. There's no doubt about that. Then yes, we have a scalable model. So, you know, we've decided that we're going to have a low cost of acquisition, clearly. We're going to try and target our marketing campaign in that way. We're going to try and make sure we inject the viral campaign. And all that is then going to allow us to monetize. There's a whole bunch of ways in which you can monetize once you have an app on the device everybody's carrying, that home screen. Guess what? It's the most valuable real estate on the planet. There's not a single piece on the planet it is more valuable than those 25 icons on that home screen. And if I can own one of those, I can guarantee it's worth a billion bucks. So that's the value prop if we can get there. You can monetize in many, many ways in building an ecosystem around that. We have an awesome executive team. We have some rock star developers. 
We do have some MBA, you'll excuse them for that. Uh, but we also have some failed startup entrepreneurs, which is very important to the mix. And you know, we have a few high school dropouts as well. So we've got the good mix here. We've got you know the right mojo going. I think it's a great team that's getting along well, and you know, I think it'll be executed really well. So what's the ask? You know, you've got to end every pitch with an ask. If you believe in that story, it's we need a little bit of money to start executing. Get the flywheel rolling. And that's what we're going to ask for the next two years. And that's what we're going to do with the money. And we believe it'll be very effective use of your money. And I hope you know you're interested. So let me know. <laughs> that's the, that was the pitch. And I, I'm glad to talk to you all. And only way I do after this is we do a mock uh, negotiation. Actually, this is a, a, a run into a mock negotiation. We won't have time today, but at a different time, maybe we'll do that. With, uh, an investor and an entrepreneur talking to each other about the terms and all of that, right? Thank you. Just so far, we don't have too much time, but let's do a show of hands and see how many of you would invest in Ravi's company. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ravi. It always is a pleasure to have you with us. Now, most actors end up rehearsing their acceptance speech in front of their bathroom mirrors. For startups, I think it is the introduction to their startup or an elevator pitch. Coming up next um, is helping you make your first impression or lasting one. Uh, Gautam Gandhi, founder of Bhagya and um, Angel Investor, and Nabhuja, president of Indonesia Network. They will help you craft an elevator pitch. So this is an active coaching session. I will uh, now pass the mic to Gautam and Padmuja. They will take us through this coaching session. Gautam, I will take Hi, how's everyone doing? Um, so we had a session today where we basically, uh, before everyone came, we asked uh, on our table uh, our teams to make a one minute video pitch and then we did a session afterwards and you'll see the new pitch we're going to call them up on stage. So we have two videos we're going to show, um, one is from Sarita and one's from Baljeet and I'll let the videos this is the before video, so before I met them, they recorded this video yesterday. So can we show um, Sarita's video first? I'm Sarita Singh, founder CEO of Inspiring for Sun Private Limited. It's a dual product technology company with offices in Hyderabad and Chicago. Our product, Trumpet, is a brand management marketplace for 360 degree only channel analytics across social, web, mobile, and traditional. We provide overall tracking, influencer insights, and competitive insights from one single dashboard. As part of the following team, we have been handling various technology product initiatives over the past 15 years with companies like Microsoft, GE, Southwest General, and Satya. My last role at Microsoft was with the director of engineering. I have met an executive engineer from Anand Koiko and in a current role, I take care of the sales and marketing and product roadmap. Other members include Anand, an ex-Microsoft um, architect. Uh, he has also worked with uh, Fortune 500 companies for providing technology integrations. But he knows the operations and quality and he has been an employed in initiators for the Fortune 500 teams. We also have a very strong advisory board. Shankar Jaya, Chairman and Dr. Sajjila Bhutti, who has 10 years experience in marketing and advertising, Harold Sainz, SGECTO, who has 30 years experience in technology and operations. We have been selected for Shukas on Product in Korea Conference in the US, Rice Conference in Hong Kong, and Web Summit in Ireland. We have a big company technology on digital analytics marketplace. We have more traction on the product from leading PR and marketing agencies across the world. 
most recently we are working with Manasana Bhavan for the product implementation for one of our client. Product is ready and we are building traction as we speak. Last year our webinar was for 25 clients. We are also 50k in uh, seed funding from friends and family and we are looking at raising two more units with a 50% stake as a pre-seeding scale now. This money will be used for global sales team expansion, marketing and sales, and technology whenever and additional integrations on board. So I know it's very interesting from Inspire for its product impact. So very brave, uh, Sweetha, to show your video before. Um, so Padraja, you see a lot of pitches. Um, would this attract your attention? And will you do, can you describe maybe what you uh, saw Sweetha present? and uh, what our product is and what would you invest or would you be interested in meeting her again? Yeah, so I think first of all, Sarita, great. A lot of acclaims and a lot of awards. But I think the one question I would have is um, who's your customer? What's the pain point that you're addressing very clearly? That probably didn't come through in the pitch. Mm -hmm. And uh, how are you going to make money? I mean, what is the revenue model? Uh, those were the two things that uh, struck out to me because that would then also shed light on how you would scale in terms of uh, how are you going to acquire customers, how are you going to scale up across geographies, across client base. I think th that entire module is something I would have liked to ask more questions on. So we, we had a similar discussion uh, in our session, our active session, and uh, Sarita has now prepared a new one in a pitch, and we're going to get her up on stage right now. Let's give a big applause. Very brave of her to come and do another one in a pitch in front of everyone. And and then you know after we do that, we can talk about your experience of what you learned differently. So let's let's give let's give her the stage. Thank you for the opportunity. So it's a slimmed down version for a minute. I don't know, I don't want to do the two minutes one. Um, so this is after all the coaching Gautam has done <laughs> on the table. So hi, I'm Sarita Singh, founder CEO of Inspiring Person, a two year old product technology company with offices in Hyderabad and Chicago. Our product trumpet is a 360 degree brand management marketplace for analytics across social, web, mobile and traditional. The problem we are trying to solve is the inability of tracking the uh, cross-platform uh, measure, ROI, the channel spend that people have, and the limited visibility of the customer's journey and the customer's behavior. The end users are typically any brand or a PR agency or any um, uh, crisis management heads of companies who would be using this product. It's a subscription-based model with a recurring revenue month on month, the clients signed for a one year, uh, one year engagement and the tool provides competitive insights, influencer insights and better ROI tracking across all the tools. We have a patent and a pending uh, technology on our analytics for the marketplace. We have traction with the leading brands and PR agencies globally and we have been selected to showcase our product across various conferences in the past six months. Signing off, Sarita Singh from Inspire. So, uh, Padmaja, uh, was it clearer this time in terms of? It was a big difference. I think it was a big difference. I uh, surely would look going for a second round discussion now. You would be interested? Yeah, yeah. What, what caught your attention this time versus the first time? I think. Um, I think first of all it was crisper and clearer. That is probably very important. All the message points came through very clear, number one. Number two, it came across as a business rather than just a product showcase to various conferences and uh, award ceremonies with all respect to all the awards that you got. Um, the third, I think it, it gave, uh, gave me a very clear picture that how was the revenue getting built up, how was it going to scale and the traction that, how did the traction really come? What is the pain point that the company is trying, the product is trying to alleviate? So I think that was very clear. Probably you shortened your pitch a bit, but one thing that I missed in the second version 
was abuse into the team, which would have been, much, which would have given much more chutzpa to the HR. But yeah, second round discussion would have been there. Now, everyone in the audience, uh, who saw the first and second, uh, clap your hands if you thought the second version was crisper and cleaner and easier. Yeah. Now, what, what's interesting is going to come and give you experience. How much time uh, did you spend preparing this for the second pitch? Minutes. 15 minutes. And how much time did you spend for the first one, the video? Half an hour. Half an hour. So, <laughs> spent actually more time in the first one, second time. What was your learning after sort of, uh, you know, after we sat together and you were, I mean, it was, it was a group learning, it wasn't just me, but, you know, feedback from the group. What was your learning, you think, your main learning that made the second pitch different for you? So the learning was, I think, to bring out the passion where, the, what the problem that we were solving. Basically, uh, uh, we, we did not really talk about why did we come up with this marketplace, why did we come up with this uh, solution. So that's something that I could not um, mention in the previous one, so that was clear to bring, bring that point across and the founding team and uh, the other details that uh, we discussed in the team. I think another lesson for everyone is that shorter is sometimes better, right? As much when there's just less information to process in the one minute, it's actually easier to understand and get everyone's attention uh, than the two minute one which seemed very long. Um, I just want to add one point actually. I think what is important learning is when you are pitching to investors, it's important to pitch a business or a venture. Why are you doing this? Who's the customer? Why are you, how are you going to build the revenue model? And how is it going to scale? Rather than a product showcase or a demo, which is another target audience. So I think that clarity of audience is very important when you start building and pitching. Yeah, I think that's very important that for different audiences, you want to tailor your pitch differently. Um, let's see the second one. Uh, we have the Baljeet's video. And I'll just give a hand to you. Thank you so much. Very brave. Uh, I don't think I would have the courage to come up and do a one minute pitch. So thank you again. Um, so we have another courageous folk at our table, Baljeet, and we'll see his video. And I run a motorcycle tour company called NC Riders. Uh, we basically cater to adventure climbers and motorcycle enthusiasts who would like to take uh, expeditions and pass on going and peace across India and overseas. Uh, we also run a motorcycle rental company uh, where we rent out a royal entries on a daily basis, weekly basis, and monthly basis. Uh, we also have a royal entries full place service station which caters to royalty owners who would like to get their uh, uh, RX maintained and post at a workshop. We currently have a team of 20 people and we have our operations out of Mumbai. Uh, we are planning to expand to uh, other metros and regional cities in the next one year, uh, Bangalore, Delhi, and Goa, finally. And we're looking forward to build uh, the most desirable most sector tool company of India. Thank you. So, Padmaja, what do you think? What is your, are you interested in uh, meeting Baljeet? Interesting. Yeah, I would love to meet Baljeet. But I think what I'm missing in this pitch is, um, again, how are you going to make money? What's the revenue model? But uh, this is this is a, not a technology play. This is a offline play, and I think the scale up model didn't come through to me clearly, especially the delivery side, execution side. And in these kind of uh, ventures, to my mind, execution is key. It's execution, execution, execution all the way. So that was what I missed in uh, this venture. So I I look forward to the. So uh, Bhajit, uh, we're going to get you on stage and. We'll do this once more. And we'll ask you to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks, Gautam. Uh, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you a lot. <laughs> so, what I learned in the last uh, one hour session that we had with uh, Gautam on our table. I would try to uh, implement that. Uh, the most critical thing that I have learned in the session is that the pitch that we are going to make for the fundraising need not be an effort. Uh, it shouldn't come across that it has to be a sales pitch. You have to be natural. Uh, you have to be explaining your venture in the simplest form you can. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with. 
so my name is Brajit and uh, me and my wife, uh, we run a motorcycle tour company based out of Bombay. Uh, so we both came from corporate backgrounds. Uh, travel was an inherent passion that we had uh, since our college days. So we are college sweethearts. And we used to take motorcycle tours across India. Uh, so the idea was that uh, whenever we took a trip, we used to go to a city, pick up a friend's bike, and then explore the nearby areas. Uh, slowly and slowly as we started doing more of these trips, we felt that there was a major logistic issue that people like people like us faced during the uh, vacation that we took. Uh, to meet that, we decided that we launch a platform which is an organized platform where people like us could come over, take a hassle-free vacation without thinking about uh, finding a bike to explore that area. Uh, looking at the accommodations, looking at the backup plan, uh, whether there is a uh, technical team in place which could take care of the breakdowns when we are having the vacations. So the point was to provide an organized platform for adventure travelers and motorcycle enthusiasts to take uh, motorcycle vacations across India and overseas. Uh, so this platform built over time. Uh, we started having like-minded people like us coming from corporate backgrounds, quitting their jobs, wanted to uh, live through their dream of traveling, joining our team. So now we have a technical team and a, a logistics team, which we have in Bombay, uh, that conducts motorcycle tours pan India. So we conduct tours to Ladakh, Himachal, Goa, Rajasthan, and we've also conducted international tours to Thailand and Cambodia on a motorbike. Uh, so Royal Enfield being our, uh, close to our heart, the company's name is Enfield Airs. Now we are planning to expand it to various locations uh, in India so that we could cater to travelers uh, who are not just local based but could take respective tours in their regions as well. So that's pretty much about us. Thank you. <coughs> How's uh, the pitch system? Is it clear? Oh, much better. First of all, I'd love to go for a holiday with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so one sale is done right here on stage. Yeah, only when I don't know what I'm going to pay for it. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's much better for sure. I think uh, the passion came through, uh, the reason for doing this came through, and I think what I was missing earlier is uh, the technology and the offline platform, which I had not understood. So, by the way, I have not met any of these entrepreneurs earlier or seen any of these pictures, so it's right off the cuff. Uh, so I think the, the offline and online play which I had not understood in the earlier pitch, that got uh, highlighted in this. I, I would like to talk, no doubt, but I think uh, I'm still missing how, how the monetization is happening, but I suppose there's not enough time for that. Uh, anything you want from your experiences of this? Uh, well, I would like to thank uh, uh, CNBC and all the mentors here. I think this is an amazing platform for uh, entrepreneurs like us to come over and interact with experienced industry professionals and get a lot of learning. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. So, we have one last one. Sorry. Um, there was one, Virginia uh, was going to do a pitch. He did not have a video earlier, but he. Uh, I think he spent the last 10 minutes preparing a one minute pitch. And I found his pitch very interesting from the beginning. Uh, he, we went around the room, uh, around our table, and did a, everyone did a one minute pitch, and I didn't understand actually what he was doing. But then he pitched it again, I thought it was really interesting. I said, Do you want to come up and do it? So he said, Yes. Yeah. So we did it. Why don't you come up and share your one minute pitch with everyone? <laughs> founder of Orex Foods. So when I was discussing uh, with Gautam, we were having a session on fundraising and on the elevator pitch. So the pitch uh, kind of we I prepared yesterday was a bit, you know, a plain pitch kind of thing. But uh, after input from Gautam, I prepared another one and uh, let's present it. So it all started 
when I came to Delhi. I am from a farming background, from a farming family in NCR region. So I had the best quality food since my childhood. And when I joined, an aspiring rural youth came to Delhi, joined SRCC with ambition of, you know, going to the corporate world. And within two, three days, spending at my relative's place in Delhi, one thing which I didn't like and with one thing which pushed me to come back to my roots was the quality of the food and Delhi. And trust me, it was pathetic. So the national capital of the country, millions of families out there are eating the same thing, they're drinking the same daily products. So that is where it clicked me and you know, I started working on it. So after passing out, I traveled across North India. We know how to do farming, to rear cattle, to grow vegetables, to grow grains, everything. But I didn't know that the search we met lot of farms, big farms, because there is a difference in rearing two kettles for your personal consumption and a good big herd for others. So commercial dairy farming, we did a research and then uh, last year we started and we rolled out the product in January 2014 in Gurgaon. So it's basically, we, if, if we talk about today, we are catering to 250 odd families and the best part the happiest part for the team is that almost 99% of the consumers are there with us for either last six months. The day they join us, they are with us. They haven't moved to any of the other brands. So that gives you a sense of accomplishment. You know, every one of us, whether we work hard, we earn money, but before going to sleep, we want smiles on our face. And that is what makes the day complete when you get a message from one of their subscribers that, you know, Mrs. Gupta is shifting to Pune from Gurgaon and she is asking where I am going to start in Pune. And you submit that message to the team and that, you know, that builds the culture in our organization. We, we strive. So the, the whole daily cycle we, which we diagnose, you know, there is a problem at every stage. All the stakeholders in the cycle are facing problems right from the farmer till the end consumer. And the people who are creating the problem are the ones who are not going to consume and not going to produce. The middlemen. So we provided a solution. We started from scratch, right from the fodder, which is the kettle is going to eat, to your kitchen. So we take care of everything. We provide you a fresh bottle of milk every morning in your kitchen. We bring 100% transparency to our, all our processes. That builds the trust. Revenues are like we are getting 25% of the spends on an average of each family. So whatever you are, let's say you are spending 10,000 on every month on your kitchen, your kitchen needs, we get 25% of the revenue of that from the hundred products. And our consumers are pushing us to start with grains, with better cereals, with vegetables. So our goal is to, you know, capture the whole kitchen needs of each and every family which we cater. So we are here to solve the problems of millions of families because we know the product is adulterated. Testing reports are coming from last five years that samples are getting filled. But we are helpless. I am being, being, being from a farmer's family. I can't go 100 kilometers to my village to get my every day. So we all are helpless. So we are, we are just solving the problem and we are making families live happy with happy food. Thank you. Padmaja, what, what do you think? Did you understand what he was doing and were you interested in learning more? Yeah, I would be. I think, uh, I think I understand the fact that you're sort of supplying the dairy products to a kitchen. But purely from an investor perspective, I think from a customer perspective, I'm almost convinced to buy from you. Right? Because it really does cater to our pain points. So you've identified the pain point. But I, come, I think from an investor perspective, uh, two or three things didn't come through, okay? And uh, I think you, your genetics of the team, that you come from a farming background and you want to bring that culture and that whole thinking into the urban area, great. 
But if you're going to go to different cities, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to uh, build products and sell them across a whole portfolio, how's it going to happen? Which is the team demanded? What are the risks of execution? Again, this is an execution play, right? Uh, I think what did not come through is this, as you scale up, how you going to brand it? Now, this is a huge marketing initiative despite the product being a very good product. I mean, no, no comments on the product. And how will you then be able to take it across cities? How are you going to distribute it? How, what's going to be your channel distribution? I think from an investor perspective, I was left with those questions in my mind. But as a consumer, you sold it to me. <laughs> well, that's not bad. I'm not a satisfied consumer, huh? Uh, so I think, you know, one of the things we saw uh, when uh, Ravi was giving his talk about investor decks and... Um, and pitching and things like that. There's, to be honest, there's two kinds of pitching. One is, which I think is actually even more important in investor deck, is the elevator one minute pitch, which you get asked every day. What do you do? If you go to a party, somebody says, what do you do? How do you describe that what do you do in one minute is actually the most important pitch you have to do. Because if in that one minute pitch you get someone interested, then only do you get the opportunity to make the PowerPoint presentation. But if you're not able to, in one minute, articulate what you do and make it interesting that the person wants to meet you again, you never get that opportunity. And most people spend all their time on that PowerPoint presentation, but they actually never get to present it as much as they think. But every day you will be asked, what do you do? And so, you know, work on the elevator pitch. It is probably the most important thing uh, in pitching. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Bob. Thank you.
Uh, you can imagine everything I was on the slide that, you know, already good as presented. We planned everything that we can, but only some of those things work, as you all know. That's what we're doing. We started only about a year and a half, two years back. We are today present in 33 cities. Um, six months back, we were in five cities. And we've done a lot of things to become one of India's largest hotel networks today. And that's why we're disrupting. So I want to quickly move on to disruption, which I think was the key piece here um, that everyone has been talking about. Um, disruption, if you read, you know, Professor Christensen's theory, who came up with this word, uh, talks about there's an incumbent in an existing industry who's overperforming or over-delivering and what the customer wants. And a new small company comes in and tries delivering performance at the level that the customer really needs. And because of that, is able to provide disruptive prices, not due to discounting, but because of those efficiencies. And the market slowly starts moving towards that player, right? Which is what happens in disruption. Now, uh, it is not a generic term, which is you come and get new prices, you disrupt an existing player. That is how it works. And I love to take the example of, you know, the taxi aggregators market, because it's something we all use, right? So Ola, Uber, all these companies that are now coming into the space across the world. Um, what's interesting is they have not just become a better way to book a camp. We always thought of them as start apps, you know, and not startups because, hey, there's a problem, there's an app for it. But if you think about it, they fundamentally changed two human behaviors, right? The first one is us and future generations may never learn to drive again, right? That's a fundamental behavior out there to change. And the second one is fundamentally we may not buy cars again. That is happening with personally when we're looking at buying a second car. So this is what a disruptor does, right? And they come in, they change the market, they change the way things are going. And um, I think, and over rooms, you know, to quickly share, what we've been doing uh, is we've been partnering with hotels uh, to bring them, we use technology and on-ground standardization to bring, uh, to bring that effect to the same market in terms of providing better services to the customer. And what we've seen over the last year and a half, we've grown from, Six months back, we were a team of about 90 to 100 employees. Uh, today, we are in 1,000, we are, we are 1,000 team members strong. And there are a couple of things that we've done which we, we, we were able to build uh, through our scale, right? The first was obviously, everyone's talked about, and I'm not going to deep, go deep into it as people. We have built very strong teams, and that is the only way that we can keep building scale, we can keep hiring the right type of people who come in and become a very important and a very preferred employer in the space. Everybody is out there to recruit today, right, as a startup. And that has helped us keep, you know, you know, help us build new businesses, innovate on what we've already been doing and inventing new processes for the industry that's not seen this before. Uh, the second thing that I think we've done is a lot of startups in their early stages when they start scaling is they use a lot of hustle to get things done, right? And that is when uh, you need to step in and say, what is the process to do this? How is there a machinery to do so? And we've worked very hard on doing that. And today we believe, uh, you know, we're talking about all the startups who are here, and I would want to leave all of you with that one key word, which is disruption is not the idea. We are not here to disrupt. That's not the concept of the startup. Uh, we are here to build really good businesses, and disruption becomes the impact or the effect of what you actually build, right? So let's keep building things. Thanks to everyone who's been here, and go out there and break industries that are going on. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Close to 3,500 crore rupees were paid in dividends and interim dividends to the promoters. In fact, in FY15 and FY16 alone, a sum of 2,083 crore rupees was paid as interim dividends to the promoters. This has aviation experts asking that if the company was able to pay 3,500 crore rupees in interim dividends, then how does it justify uh, its, uh, its approach in the capital market and raising funds? They're also asking that why was this amount not put to use to address the company's debt which stands at 4,002 crore rupees. It is a point of concern as to why was this money not being put to better use in terms of you know investment in the airline company itself. CNBC TV18 has posted this query or these queries to Indigo Airlines and we're yet to hear from them. With that, it's back to you. 
All right, Farah, thanks for that. So the Indigo IPO could be facing some kind of turbulence going ahead. But let's shift focus to some stock-specific action. l and Finance Holdings Limited surged as much as 9.4% in intraday trade today. This at the back of uh, a CNBC TV 18 source-based uh, information that American private equity fund Bob Quinkus is in talks to acquire at least 25% stake in the company. That's not all. The move has been seen as a part of Bob Quinkus's plans to create a financial services portfolio in India. We learn that the deal with LNT Finance will trigger an open offer if successful. But LNT, the parent company, will still continue to retain a majority stake in the firm. We also learn that Warburg Pincus is in talks with more than one financial player and is keenly looking at acquiring a significant interest in BFS companies. We reached out to Warburg Pincus, of course. They said that they cannot comment on investment decisions as for policy. Meanwhile, LNT Finance interestingly said that they regularly meet investors as part of their investor relations exercise and added that they do not comment on speculative news reports. So that could be one large deal in the offing. But moving on to news from the capital, the Justice AP Shah Committee on the Minimum Alternate Tax has wound up its discussions with various industry bodies and, of course, government agencies today itself. The Central Bureau of Direct Taxes was the last government agency to make its presentation today. The three-member committee will now form up its views and submit its final report by the end of July. We learn that the industry representations have have hopped on the view that MAT should not be applicable on FBIs and FIIs who do not have a place of business in India and has further argued that such a change in stance has hampered the image of India having a consistent and stable tax structure. The Shah Committee may also not look into the various double taxation avoidance agreements or DTAAs that India has with other countries as far as the applicability of MAT is concerned. Okay, let's take another break on that note. Coming up on the other side, Sahara throws in the towel, tells Supreme Court it cannot repay 36,000 crore rupees in just 18 months. That story on the other side, stay right there. CNBC TV 18, celebrating 15 years of leadership. TV 18, celebrating 15 years of leadership. Welcome back, you're still with Reporter Zari on CNBC TV 18. We cannot pay 36,000 crore rupees to SEBI in just 18 months. That's what Sahara made very clear to the Supreme Court in unequivocal terms today. 
Remember, the Embattled Group has been asked to pay 36,000 crore rupees to bond investors, which it has to deposit within 18 months and in nine installments. Ashwit Kumar, who has been tracking the developments in the Sahara saga from day one, joins in now with the details. Ashmit, what was the stance that Sahara held today? And, you know, what's the road ahead now? Well, the road ahead, what we can say with certainty is that uh, the, the never-ending saga that we have seen with the uh, Sahara Parival on one hand, Sebi and Supreme Court on the other, we're getting ready for yet another chapter, yet further litigation in this case. Uh, Sahara today, as a part of today's hearing, made its position very clear uh, that despite the certainty that was brought in by the Apex Court that the money has to be uh, paid, 36,000 crore rupees has to be paid within a period of 18 months, Sahara Parival clarifying its position that in no way, uh, it is in no position to meet this obligation, to meet this commitment, that it cannot comply. Uh, with the prescriptions of the Apex Court order that it cannot uh, dish out that sum of money, 36,000 crore rupees, uh, and that this is the position that it will go ahead with and will file an application to that effect in the Apex Court. Now, the Supreme Court came out with a sharp response, a curt response uh, to this stance by Sahara Parival. The Apex Court is very clear on its position. Uh, one, it held that it cannot allow a stalemate as far as the repayment schedule is concerned, one. And two, that it held, uh, the second point that the Supreme Court made is that it's open to the idea of appointment of a receiver for selling of Sahara's assets. So clearly the Supreme Court taking a tough position, but clearly the Sahara Parivar also not backing down, getting ready for yet another round of battle, which we expect will pan out uh, come next week. Back to you. All right, Ashmit. So the never-ending Sahara saga will, of course, be tracked very closely by Ashmit Kumar. Thank you so much for joining in with that. Moving on and continuing with news from the capital, the government has decided to crack the whip on telecom operators. Union Telecom Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad has said that the onus of ensuring that there are no call drops lies on all the telecom service providers who should look at improving their coverage. Additionally, the union government has also decided to ask all the states to improve the telecom coverage inside government buildings also. A new structure is being worked out which will be used to evaluate telecom companies on the call drop issue. As far as the audit part is concerned, my department is going to do it as early as possible. Um, Mr. Rakesh Gar will be going to meet the Urban Development Secretary very soon and we will work out the institutional mechanism because these steps which I have taken are basically supplemental. Ultimate job of addressing the infrastructure the bottlenecks and frequency optimization is to be taken by the operators themselves. Well, on that note, it's time to say goodbye on this edition of Reporter's Diary. Thank you so much for watching the show. Of course, stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. Lots more up ahead. CNBC TV 18, celebrating 15 years of leadership.
Legacy TV 18, celebrating 15 years of leadership. TV18's Young Tells has played a crucial role in providing a platform for startups over the years, especially in the years when it wasn't the thing to do. From tutorials to exclusive interviews to now bringing you our first live Young Tells mentor session, we are proud to be associated with over 2,000 young and bright entrepreneurs. Now please join me in welcoming on stage the woman who decided to disrupt state business news television 14 years ago when she decided that Indian entrepreneurs had stories to tell that were engaging, informative and optimistic. Please welcome on stage CNBC TV 18's Managing Editor, Shireen Khan. Thank you very much, Sriti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, someone said reflection is the noblest path to wisdom, and birthdays, anniversaries, and doctor's appointments often force us to reflect. And so that's exactly what I've been doing over the past few weeks as I come to terms with getting older. Let me narrate a very funny story to you. In February earlier this year, Kunal Bhair of Snapdeal, who also happens to be a young sir, at the NASCOM Summit, on stage in front of about 500 odd people said that I was a universal mother for young chefs. Now I should have been upset because it really isn't dignified rubbing someone's nose in the fact that you're an old fossil, but I really wasn't because I feel a strong connection with the people that have been featured on this show over the past 14 years. And today I do feel very proud of what our young chefs have been able to achieve and what we've been able to build here on the show. I attribute Young Tech's success to what I believe are fundamental principles for any successful business. We had a good idea, but we also got the timing right. You would all agree that timing is critical. Being behind the curve is a clear downer, but being too ahead of the curve can also be a challenge. We also got the team right. Over the years, we've seen a few changes, but the team has been aligned to the same mission, to find ideas worth nurturing. You will once again all agree that having a purpose and a team that believes in that purpose is crucial to success. 
We've always welcomed competition here at Young Turks because we believe it validated our category, a category that we created. Competition has also helped us grow our market, but we've never been complacent about our leadership. We've sharpened our differentiation, we've created newer niches within our core, and we've innovated to stay relevant. These, I believe, are the mantras for any good business to stay strong and profitable. A meaningful brand must also touch people in some way. It must excite, infuse, inspire. And I feel at Young Turks, we've been able to do that over the past 14 years. Now, in our endeavor to nurture the startup ecosystem in India, I'm proud to announce the launch of the first Young Turks Mentors Program. 14 of India's brightest investors, angels, VCs, and entrepreneurs have joined hands with us today to mentor 43 startups at first on television in India. You will shortly see a glimpse of what happened here earlier this afternoon. This is going to be an annual mentoring program, and I cannot thank our mentors enough for their time and encouragement. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to our 14 mentors for joining us here this evening. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful speakers for giving us some food for thought tonight. Uh, they will be joining you in a short while from now and taking us through their own inspirational stories. On this note, I'd also like to thank my own mentor, Sempil Chengal Varayan. Uh, he's going to be here shortly, so a salute to him. And uh, to our CEO, Anil Unial, thank you very much, Anil, for uh, never letting revenue drive editorial. I can't say that about other newsrooms. Uh, thank you to our team of editors, our camera persons, and our reporters for your enthusiasm for putting up with me on a daily basis. And if you give me the opportunity and the liberty, I would like to call on t on stage my entire team, and it's an all women's team, uh, Saina, Saurabhi, Shruti, and Megha, to please join me on stage because they're the ones who put this magic together week after week, and this show would not be what it is today without them. So, guys, if you can very quickly come up on stage. I know, I know a lot of you are behind the screens there, but this is the, this is the one chance that I get to play a uh, proud mother, so I'm going to make full use of it. And, and the other two are on their way here, so give us 10 more seconds, and, and they're going to sprint their way up, up to stage. It's not easy, by the way, putting this show together, finding the right people, shooting with them, explaining to them why we need six hours to shoot with them for a six-minute capsule. But at the end of the day, it's all worthwhile. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Young Turks team. And thank you very, very much for doing what you do every day. And let me end by talking to a woman who saved my life in many ways. A woman I've had the privilege of interviewing on Young Turks, Cheryl Sandberg, and uh, she said recently at a commencement speech that it's a luxury to combine passion and contribution. It's also a clear path to happiness, and I believe that's what we've been able to do here with this show. So thank you very, very much. And here's a glimpse of the Young Turks Mentor Program, the first ever that we rolled out. They enjoyed the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. session that just happened in, before in the day. Uh, thank you, Shireen, for that wonderful speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to call our first speaker for the evening. We first shot with him in 2010 when he 
when it seemed there to go where no Indian startup had ventured before, the energy drink market. His offering, Zynga, costed almost 280% less than the energy drinks giant Red Bull. Today, he promises to bring back childhood memories with just a sip of his traditional brews that retail under the moniker Paperboard. We bring you Neeraj, Neeraj Kakar, co-founder and CEO of Hector Beverages. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Neeraj Tucker. Cordoba, uh, Taco Bell is growing at a much faster pace than hamburger joint. 
how, how does this happen that Mexican has become the mainstream food? It's because those 30 million migrants which have been moving across the border for the last 100 odd years. Pizza, pizza is an interesting story. See, before, it's, it's there on everybody's mind now, but before 1930s, actually, uh, pizza was not very popular in Italy also. It was a very, very small part. When, when the first set of migrants moved to New York, they settled in Harlem, and it was an easy food for cooking for young, single young men. Like that's how pizza became, started becoming part of the mainstream New York uh, culture. From there, it went all across. In like last 80, 90 years, so pizza suddenly is one of the most amazing ones. Like the very short span of time is the international food. It's actually available in the small town where I grew up now. Obviously, it is by a couple of companies, but, but the journey has been very, very fast. One thing, sorry about this. Yeah, so one thing I think which is more interesting closer home was the growth of Golgappa Pani in Bangalore. I moved there in 1998 first. Actually, there was no place to get good authentic Golgappa in, in, in Bangalore. But now you go, in front of every food world, you will find this guy with the stall there. Uh, you know, this, generally this guy is from Eastern UP. You talk to him, this guy says, Kannada Gutila. Kannada nahi aata uh, But, if, if, you know, with the language barrier in place, a lot of the customers of this guy is uh, the, the local Karnigas who are consuming Golgappas in large quantities. The thing which has moved faster than Golgappas in Bangalore is Momos in Delhi. Uh, if, you have, if you are here in 1990s, there were only two places where you could get Momos. One was in Chanakya Puri, like behind Chanakya Theater, there was one place. And one was in Kamla Nagar. There was no other place. So actually, few Tibetans trying to make by by selling momos. Right now, it is it's, it's one of the most popular things here, like every nook and corner. It's actually giving, uh, strangely giving bread pakoda the run for the money as a snack of Delhi these days. Uh, like last week, I saw, actually saw a Bikaner Wala sweet shop, a typical Rajasthani guy, uh, actually making momos there. Like it's it's it's. The journey has been amazing for Momo in the last 20 odd years. Kalina East, near Santa Cruz. This is a story of Mahesh. Mahesh is Mahesh Chaudhary, I worked with him. Uh, so these four guys, they live in a dorm. All of them come from North Bihar. Every year they make one trip to North Bihar, the Ganga for sure. And every, every time somebody is going there, these guys ask for the other person to bring Sattu from home. So why, why is Mahesh missing Sattu so much? Is it the question of his identity, his, his belongingness, what is there? Uh, and I'm not even trying to answer that question because it's, it's, it's quite layered. The question which I'm trying to answer and time would tell, can Sattu become part of the mainstream Mumbai market? See, this is, this is the business we are in. Uh, we are in the business of taking beverages from one market of India, one regional market and taking it nationally. Kokum is one of our bigger success stories. It's a Konkani drink, it's a super true. Like, you know, it's, it's, if, if, you, if you meet a Konkani guy somewhere, that guy has been like, they have grown up on this one. Nita is my most favorite food vendor. She, uh, she, is, she is very popular in her own right. She has a stall in front of uh, uh, the jail in Handelin in North Goa. Uh, and like, like she so popular, like the local MLA would come and take the, uh, drink his coconut there. So it's, 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 it's uh, see, she introduced me to this drink for the first time. We took it national and it's, it's one of our higher selling products. Uh, last year, uh, uh, you know, my father was uh, going through a cataract operation in Artemis Hospital, uh, uh, Gurgaon. And my father is very proud of what I do. And like for every chance he gets, he tells the tale about stories to every person he meets. And uh, so on the operation later, he told the story to the doctor. And the doctor incidentally was also a fan of Figaro. And uh, so, so they discussed it on a, uh, and, and when they came out, I discussed the doctor. And he told me that Kokum is the most favorite variant which she likes amongst all the range we have. I'm very surprised. In my mind, I was thinking that he's from Bombay or something. And I asked him and he told me that he's from Haryana. Now, that's a big win. Like, you know, if somebody from Haryana can like Kokum and, you know, you know it, it, it wouldn't have possi been possible if you wouldn't have tried it. So, so that's uh, what gives, is probably the most satisfying moment of this entire journey. Coming back to this purple carrot and the kanji story. So I've been trying to make it all this while. Like I never got this drink again. And I was trying to make all this while. So I searched around for purple carrots everywhere. Now, in India what has happened, and this one, another thing which is like 
like you won't notice very uh, generally, is that orange carrots have taken over. You know, purple carrots have disappeared. They are not no longer available. So if we have very one small quantity here and there, so I was trying to get large quantity of purple carrots so that we can make kanji. So we search around India, not got it. Search around the world, found it that found that in southern Turkey, they that's the only place which grows purple carrots anymore. Like a very small area. So I, I landed there, Adana, which is a very, very small airport. I landed there and you know in the evening I went out for dinner. And the table right next to me, this guy was drinking a, you know, something which looked very familiar. So I asked the, uh, the steward that, you know, I want something like that. And uh, so that guy got a drink. That, you know, I was perplexed. Like I had a sip. I was sitting there for five minutes without speaking anything. That drink was exactly similar to my Mati's kanji. And they call it salgam, you know. So, so like I, I'm not even sure what to do at that stage. It was like extremely happy Eureka moment for me. And then I searched around and uh, did the thing. So that drink actually is a drink called salgam, which originated in southern Turkey, which is a drink which travels around the Silk Road. And it's a pretty popular thing along Afghanistan, Pakistan, and some parts of North India. And I was extremely happy. Next day, went uh, went out, bought 50 kgs of purple carrots. And, and you know, I was bringing them to India. So, uh, you know, so landing in Delhi, and actually that was the time when this mad cow disease was going on in Europe, if you remember. So, this guy, like at the airport, uh, thought hold of me, like, he's, he's like, he's carrying, like, he was very suspicious about, like, why is this guy carrying 50 kg of carrots around? You know, and so there was, like, a lot of questions, you know, another uh, story to be told from other times. But however, I realized that that's not the thing which I should uh, do, and so we 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 got. So next time, uh, you know, we started importing the seeds from uh, Turkey. These are uh, purple carrot seeds. We we tried the crop two years back in three places. We tried it in Ujjain, we tried it in Palampur, and we tried it in Uti. So Ujjain crop, like because of different tem temperature and climate uh, variation, uh, uh, so th those couple of crops failed in Ujjain. Uh, the Uti crop is where the hope is right now. Like actually, that thing is doing very well right now. So we are. Uh, it's our 17th attempt at this crop, and this is the actual uh, picture of that field. And uh, where uh, so you can you can think of me as a person sitting, you know, in this shade of this tree and looking at this uh, large field and waiting for the carrots to sprout so that I can make the drink which I love. And the I can relive the memory which I had for last 20 odd years. Uh, uh, I think, see the moral of the story is, uh, all of you would be chasing some amount of purple carrots in your life. Uh, if you are not doing it, please definitely do. It's a very, very interesting path. Uh, the only thing which I can say is, when you're chasing your purple carrots, if you can make the world a little bit better, if you can bring the people a little bit closer, these carrots turn magical. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions to Neera? Yeah. Hi, Neera. Hi. Uh, so I believe, how did you, you know, if to put in the technical terms, how did you pivot so quickly from Zynga to paperboard? And how was that experience for you as an entrepreneur to realize that something you started wasn't getting the kind of response that you expected? So how did that immediate transition happen? Yeah, I think, I think a very interesting question. I think one of the things which, uh, which has helped me personally a lot is reading a book called Lean Startup. You know? So I, I unfortunately didn't read it at the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. I read it somewhere in the middle. So there was some money lost in the first part. But I think that, uh, if, if I, I presume all of you would know about it. If you, if you don't, just, just go ahead and read that book. It, it gives you a lot of answers. We, uh, we follow Lean Startup. Like it's made for technology companies, but we follow it very, very strongly in the consumer good industry. If some recipe is not working, we are not you know, we are not unwilling to change it. We are, we keep improving our recipes. So, see the promise of few of the large food brand is consistency over long number of years, right? So, we are not promising consistency. If I can make my product better next year, I will try to make it better. If I can get mangoes which are more green than the last time, I will get those green mangoes and make better ampanna next year. If I get the arm which is, you know, more pata and like more raswala, I will try to get the arm and make my arm rest better. So every year I will improve my product. I, like, you know, every stage is some version of arm panna which you are tasting. And the next version is better than the previous one. Hi, my name is Ishan. I run a company, my name is Aduka. 
a great business, big fan. Uh, two things. One is a comment, can you please get Coca on Indigo Airlines? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a pain to not see it and then settle for the next best. Uh, the question is also from there, how do you decide which thing goes on, let's say an airline like Indigo, I always wonder like how did these guys who have 10 awesome drinks decide that this one should go on the menu versus not the other one, what's the driving factor? Correct, so I think, so they see the pipeline is so huge, like, you know, uh, so there are so many drinks in my lab right now, which like we R&D, we keep doing, which I, I'm in love with, like there's a drink, Soul Curry, which we are making, like, you know, it's such, it's such deliciousness, like, you know, it's, it's the drink which, every, every time I go to my R&D lab, like I'll have two, three glasses of it. And I want to bring it out, but you're right that like, you can't do, like you can't have like 100 SQs going out at the same time, so you'll have to phase it out. I think it has to be a complex, because of the education, it has to be a complex grid of region, seasonal, and uh, and, and time, uh, you know, so you have to do that grid and launch some products in different quadrants. But yeah, I think that's the supply chain challenge we need to solve. A lot of companies are solving it far better, like companies like Zara and uh, Fab India are doing so many SQs with so much success, we can do it, we are trying to figure it out. Hi, uh, hi, Niraj, I'm Gautam. Uh, I, 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 it was interesting to hear from you about your background and how uh, you were uh, so much into uh, the carrot drink or into coca. So, is your, would, in the future, are you planning to focus more on the uh, traditional segment or would it be more towards like natural uh, juices and, and all that? I think, see, the whole point about the same lean startup thing, right? So, whole point about this is that you keep experimenting, you keep finding your niche and whenever you find success, you scale it up. Scale it up like nobody's business. So, we find our success in the traditional uh, uh, uses and that's what we will try to do is uh, launch more and more of those and we'll launch, we'll make it to more and more number of consumers. So that's, that's where the focus is. Any more questions? I have a question, Neeraj. Uh, congratulations on raising Series E just yesterday, another $30 million that yeah. you raised. So congratulations on that. <laughs> so, uh, what, what's the next a goal for you and what's the next goal as far as paper boat is concerned what are you going to do with all of this money you've started a new facility in Mysore where do you see yourself headed from here on I think see on a personal level I'm pretty relaxed I think it's just like you know so if you can imagine a situation where just before the fight you take the mud in your hand and you're like rubbing it on your hands and you're you are like I'm ready to I'm ready for the big fight so I am ready for the big fight and uh, I think the uh, the thing at this moment is to do more and more of what we are doing, more of the same, more products, more geographies, uh, uh, you know, more dif different variants and, and taking it first thing, different parts of India and then global. That's what we try to do. And uh, number one in the beverage market, that's the ambition, that's the goal? I, yeah, I think Coke is a great product. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I work there, so I learned my trade from there. And uh, I worked there for the longest time. Uh, we, will, we can coexist and we can coexist there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Neeraj would request you to stay on stage. Neeraj would request you to stay on stage. We along with Titan Celestial Time are celebrating the spirit of entrepreneurship. Request you to kindly access this token of appreciation. This is masterfully crafted for those who are relentlessly charting new paths and the ones who own the time to future. Thank you. Thanks, Neeraj. Time to call on our next speaker. As a young college girl, Shaheen Mistri began working with street kids and she hasn't looked back since. With the Kanksha Foundation and Teach for India, Shaheen has transformed the way urban youth approaches what we tend to call social work. Her philosophy of each one, teach one, is truly special. Take a look. A social and educator par excellence. A woman who learned global recognition for her devotion to educating and empowering the less privileged children of Mumbai and Pune. The CEO of Teach for India. An organization is providing a platform for the Indian youth to be the change they wish to see. CNBC TV Asia welcome Shaheen Mistry to the Young Turks Conference 2015.
please put your hands together for CEO of Teach for India, Shaheen Misri. Um, you have to imagine. I want you to imagine a crowded street outside the hotel today in the rain. And you're walking down that street and you come across a 12-year-old child who's living on the side of the street. I want you to imagine for a second uh, asking her what her dream is, asking her where she goes to school, whether she will finish school, and then I want you to imagine you turn and ask her, who is Maya Angelou? Who's the poet Maya Angelou? What will she say, that child who lives on the side of the street? Well, this time when I was walking down, um, that same 12-year-old child in your imagination, says, Didi, wait, wait, I'll tell you who my Angelo is. Me and my friends, we wrote a poem based on the poet, my Angelo. And here's the poem. You may look down upon us because we are from the slums, but we'll rise like educated people and show the world we can do something in life. She's telling me this in English. You may treat us badly, making fun of us, teasing us, discriminating. You may separate us, ignore us, but with love, we will rise. In spite of our discouraging neighborhood and conservative background, we will rise like the day which comes after the night. We will learn how to fly in the sky in the sky, flying high like a bird, in the freedom of the light, we will rise, we will rise, we will rise. That's Jyoti today. A couple of weeks ago, she graduated from St. Xavier's College, same college that I graduated from uh, many years ago. When we first started working with Jyoti, she was 12 years old. She didn't speak a word of English. She didn't have a father. She didn't have a dream. But she had a fantastic teacher. She had a teacher who changed her life. And if you talk to Jyoti today and you say, Jyoti, what do you want to do? She'll tell you, I want to go abroad and I want to study filmmaking and I want to be a documentary filmmaker. And if you say, why a documentary filmmaker, like I asked her a few weeks ago, she'll say, because I want to say things that have substance. And yet, the truth is that when you're walking down most streets anywhere in this country and you do find that street child, or that child at the signal, and you do ask them, who is Maya Angelou, they will not know who Maya Angelou is. The truth is that 90% of our children will not even have the opportunity to go to college and to get through college. 90%. And so, for 24 years, I've had the privilege and blessing of working with thousands of children and thousands of teachers in an attempt to really say, how can we redraw India for our children? How can we make this a country where every child can understand the soul and spirit of the poetry of Maya Angelou? Okay, you have to imagine another picture here. There are, um, there's a picture here of a, a news anchor. Her name is Avantika. Um, and she joined Teach for India uh, 
after 10 years of being a news anchor. And she came in and she said, I'm going to teach in a school not too far from this hotel, a very low income school for two years through the program that we run, which is called the Teach for India Fellowship. And she came and she said, I've been successful my whole life, 10 years as a news anchor. How difficult can teaching grade two children actually be? And then she came to our training institute and she walked into a group of grade three students and she came to me the same day and she said, I'm quitting. And I said, Avantika, you can't quit. It's not even been a week. And she said, no, you don't understand. It's too difficult. They don't tell you how far behind these children are. This gap can't be bridged. Anyway, we all sat around her and we hugged her and we said, you know, lots of people feel this way in their first week of teaching. You will be fine. The second picture on this side, which isn't showing up on the slide, shows her 18 months later when I walked into her classroom, again, not too far from here. She was teaching grade three. She had stuck it out for 18 months. When she started with those kids 18 months earlier, they were not able to read alphabets. I walked into that classroom and I see children sitting on the edge of their seat reading the unabridged version of Oliver Twist. And not just reading it, but analyzing it and debating and I turned to my city director and I said, quickly, Google, what grade level is the unabridged version of Oliver Twist? And she Googled it and she said, it's a grade six text. These kids who were not reading alphabets 18 months before were reading the unabridged version of Oliver Twist. And this is not a story about reading. This is a story about the potential of every single one of us in this room and every single child across this country who is not in this room and likely will not one day be in this room. Um, and to bring us to life, a short video.
Nirali's willingness to work hard, Nirali's belief that we can actually do this for every child across the country. And so what Teach for India does, and my earlier organization, Akamsha, is we work with hundreds and thousands of teachers um, because we believe that we need a movement of these teachers in every aspect of what we call the puzzle of educational inequity. Um, and so people like Narani and Avantika teach full-time for two years, and then they go off and they find their piece in this puzzle. Um, sorry, you have to imagine a lot of stuff here. Okay, this is not coming. Um, uh, you have to imagine them in this puzzle, but let me give you a little glimpse of, of what my day today was like. Just before this, a couple of hours ago, I met one of our alumni who's trying to figure out how to use artificial intelligence to get computers to predict how children can learn. And he's working on a tool to be able to do that. Again, two years in the classroom, understanding the reality, and now he's trying to figure out how can technology bring about a change in that puzzle. Or you have sitting right here, Aditya and Shafali, who are two Teach for India fellows who are saying, let's grow the movement from within and are on our Delhi team. Just in Delhi itself, there are more than 280 fellows teaching in this city. Or you have fellows like Gaurav and Nandita and Seema who said, excellent classrooms aren't enough, we need excellent schools. And so they're setting up in partnership with the government excellent schools for low-income kids. Or you have alumni like Shashank who's saying, we need to do this through politics. We need our politicians to be different so that our children's lives will be different. So our alumni, after the two years of teaching, go off and say, how can we be a multiplier and more important than that, how we work together, because it's not just about individual excellence, it's about all of us actually working together. I'm so happy this slide came up, because I really wanted you to see this. I'm going to end with two quick stories um, that I think stand for me, the power of children and the power of what we do when we unleash their potential. Um, this is one of my students. Um, his name was Latif. Um, and he came into an Akamsha classroom when he was 10 years old. He was one of those kids. I talk about most of my kids in the past saying they were so naughty, they were so difficult. This kid wasn't like that. He walked in and he was one of those dream kids. He was good at everything. Beautiful, beautiful child. One of those rare people in the world who walk into a room and the whole room just becomes a little bit brighter just because of his presence. Anyway, he died very, very tragically um, a couple of years after he starred in a big musical uh, that we did with our program. And it was extremely sad. He was in college. He was in this musical. He had people willing to support his whole future. And I was driving to Pune, and I almost got to Pune, and I got a call saying, Latif is in the ICU. Turn my car around before I reached um, to say goodbye. He had passed away. The reason I tell you the story, though, is the next day in the community, I was with his elderly grandfather, who was his favorite person in the whole world. And his grandfather said, Didi, I took 14,000 rupees out of the trunk, and I put it in Latif's hand. And I said, Latif, take this money and go to a private hospital. This is not an ordinary illness. Don't go to a government hospital. And Latif, because he loved his grandfather so much and he didn't want him to go back to work, without telling anyone, took that 14,000 rupees, hid it under the bed, went to a government hospital and died less than 12 hours later. And I think that that day changed my life because I used to think that I knew what it meant to give. I used to think, I'm in this world of giving, like it's what I do every day. And Latif helped me see that we don't have any idea of our capacity to give, of how selfless and how good and how pure each one of us can be as human beings. And I learned that from Latif. And every chance I get, I tell that story again and again, both for myself to keep Latif alive for me, but 
to share that very important thought. And then talking about giving, I'm going to end with one last story. Uh, this is today my very dear friend at the time of this photograph, one of our students, again, uh, had to be dragged to school every day, uh, Seema. Um, and Seema didn't want to study and she didn't want to come to school and she had this fantastic teacher, Rajri, who said, you're going to come to school. And Rajri would go to her home and she'd drag her out of the community and she'd bring her to school. And Seema said, I don't believe in myself. I don't believe in myself. And every day Rajri would look at her and say, that's okay. I believe in you. That's okay. I believe in you. And Seema started believing in herself. And despite the fact that both her elder brothers had fallen out, dropped out of school, she stayed in school, she graduated from school, she went to college, first kid in her community to go to college, stood second in college, had a dream to work in a big office, got into an MBA program, was nervous about not getting in, and that was the second year that we had launched the Teach for India Fellowship. So she also applied to the Teach for India Fellowship to be a teacher. So Seema comes to me and she says, Didi, I don't know what to do. I have a big problem. And I said, what's your problem, Seema? And she said, I got into the MBA school and I also got into Teach for India. What should I do? You know, my kid had this choice to make. And I said, Seema, go home and you'll figure it out. And I heard a few days later that she chose to relocate to Pune to teach a group of kids in a government school. She joined Teach for India. Um, and and uh, a few months later, I met her and I said, Seema, that's her with her kids. I said, how did you decide? I mean, I have people from IAM nervous about doing Teach for India because what's going to happen to their career? And for you with your background. And she said, D, in the end, it was so easy. You see, a teacher changed my life. What could I do that could be more important? than that. Um, so she graduates after two years from the fellowship and then she says, now I want to start a school. And so along with a group of alumni, she starts a school and she starts working as a teacher. And today she's the principal of a government school in Mumbai and she's devoted her entire life um, to changing the lives of kids. So that's full circle where, where it's come after 24 years. Um, I was three days ago, um, in Greece, and uh, I was driving, and suddenly I looked up, um, and I couldn't help thinking of the poem that I started with, uh, flying high in the sky, in the sky, flying high, we will rise, we will rise, we will rise. I think if a cloud can become an angel, what is it really that together we can't do in this country for our kids and for ourselves? and for our country. Thank you. Thanks, Shahi. Start talking. Okay. Any questions for Shahi? Shahi, I'm firstly wonderful. I mean, I've heard so much about Teach of India, but I didn't know how deep it was till I heard you. Uh, as an ecosystem, we are startups. We, we do a lot of things. Somewhere we would like to give back. Uh, you should tell us how as startups we can give back. Yeah. Can you put the slide back on? The last slide? <laughs> Just my emails up there, but I think, thank you for asking the question. I, I always try to not uh, forget to, to answer that question. Um, we really believe that this is a movement that can only, only exist and win if all of us does something, um, something small. And, and I mean something really small, as small as the next time you stop at the traffic light, are you going to talk to the child who stops at the traffic light? Because you know it makes a massive difference when you do. Um, or can you donate money? Can you build? Can you spread an awareness? Can you help us find a fellow? Can you join the fellowship? This year we have a 63-year-old um, in the fellowship. So it's, it's anyone, anywhere who wants to make a difference who can come in. Um, our website um, has a lot of information on it, on how you can get involved, how you can help. But don't limit yourself also to what is on there. If there's anything you wish to do for children, just contact us and we'd love to talk to you about it. Hi, Shanti. My name is Arushika and I'm currently volunteering at uh, Kanpur Hakeetha Dry School. 
So today I've just uh, taken a leave to come for this. I just wanted to know why is <laughs> I wanted to know why is Teach for India registered as a non-profit or a NGO? Why Teach for Brazil, Teach for US, or Teach for any other country is comes under education? So as far as I know, Teach for America is also a non-profit. Um, but the reason Teach for India is a non-profit is just so that we can raise donations from the public and have access to government funding as well. Um, so we chose to be a non-profit. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, Jesse. My reasons why. I mean, it just seemed like we wanted it to be run on donations and not be a revenue model. Also, because we're working with the poorest kids in government schools, there's very little scope for revenue in this kind of an organization. First of all, awesome. And I also didn't know all the things about Teach for India. My question is a little different. Um, so many of us probably support some kid for education. That's pretty easy to do. You pay the fees as a system. Um, do you know of any institutions that will help the child after they have graduated from college? Because that's when the guidance stops. The system gets you that far, but in India getting a job isn't that easy or simple. You need to know a whole bunch of things on how to look. Plus your parents then start springing into action and saying, oh, you know, should you go to work or whatever. Um, and also to add to the question from her, you know, is there a way that we can help these kids at least get employed if we have a vacancy? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think the short answer is there's a very big gap that you've identified in that space. Um, having said that, a lot of organizations like my organization, Akanksha, we have a lot of alumni now from our program. We have an alumni program for our kids as well. So we would give them scholarships and different things like that. So a lot of organizations, NGOs that work with kids do have schemes in place to support them later. There are also a growing number of mentoring organizations for kids um, that are really, really promising, I think, because it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So if you're interested, you can become a mentor to one child um, and help them in that way. But I think like everything that we have right now is insignificant compared to the needs. So these are, are very big problems. I was talking a little bit earlier today to someone sharing that like Teach for India now in Pune has started the first English medium government secondary schools in the city. There wasn't a single, a single English medium secondary school in the city. So secondary education, what happens after college, these are big areas of need and focus. Uh, hi. Uh, firstly, I would want to say that you guys are doing a great job. And also since, uh, you know, in schools, uh, people are volunteering and helping kids to, you know, uh, to learn more. But what about uh, villages where schools are not existing? So are we doing something for that as well? Yeah. So our fellowship program just runs right now in seven cities. But our alumni are working across the country in urban and rural areas. So there's a lot of work happening uh, in the rural space as well. Our hope is to be able to take our fellowship program rural as well. We're just six years old right now. Um, so one, one step at a time and we're adding complexity to it. But there's, again, same answer to the last question, just huge need for more and more work, especially in the rural area. Yeah, one last question. Hey, hi. Uh, I'm from Construction Industry, so I just want to ask you, how can I link uh, Teach for India with all the construction sites that we're working? So we're working in some nice sites, and we kind of work in the other major cities, and these are the cities where we're working in the other major cities, so Um, and if you can do something, 
Um, that would be amazing. Thank you, Shaheen. Request you to be on stage for a while. We, along with Titan, are celebrating the spirit of entrepreneurship and would love kindly accept this token of appreciation from our side. Thanks, Shaheen. Moving on, our next speaker was not only born with a silver spoon, but with the DNA for Bollywood. Abhishek Bachchan has to his credit over 50 feature films as actor and producer and is today pushing himself beyond the rigors and glamour of Bollywood to step into the arena of sports. Take a look. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Abhishek Bachchan. into 
theater. Mm. My father and mother are both actors. Um, you know, the people that came into the house and who were socializing with my family were pr predominantly from a creative field. Either they were writers or poets or actors or directors. So you grow up in an atmosphere which is completely surrounded by creativity. And um, because of that, your friends are the children of actors. Yeah. Um, you know, when I came into the film industry now 15 years ago, my entire generation was a generation, I mean, we were all uh, literally from Tushar to Uday to Ritik to Zayed. I mean, uh, we all literally went, went to school in the same car. We were all part of a carpool because we were all neighbors. Um, my, I, I, you know, I opened my, my gate and Ajay Devgan lives opposite me and Dharamji is next door with Bobby and so, you know, it's just, uh, that was the, the neighborhood we grew up in. So this is the life we knew. Hmm. And I think that's what just, you know, it, it, it sparks that uh, curiosity. Um, whenever we used to watch any film or say Dad, I remember I used to try and enact um, the climax of the film, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which unfortunately for my sister, in, you know, entailed a lot of violence. So she um, was at the brunt of a lot of my uh, acting and uh, so you just grow into that. So nobody forced me. It's just something I always wanted to do. And then when I, I was uh, about nine when I was sent to boarding school mm. in Europe, I was in a British boarding school. And, um, you know, sports played an integral part of our curriculum. Yeah. Uh, we, had, we had to do sports every day. My, my school was uh, in the mountains. Uh, so they, there was a lot of emphasis on outdoor activity mm. and sport. Uh, for me, at that age of 9, 10, you know, all I used to ever look forward to is um, when's the next school play and, you know, when's the next basketball match. Okay. And um, that just grew from there into a passion. Okay. So, all right. Nobody forced you to, to do no. what you're doing. Although that story sounds a lot better. Right? <laughs> that you were forced into getting into basketball. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you became an actor. But the problem, and I, and I speak. Uh, about this problem from a perspective of the challenge that brands face, right? And we're talking about startups and yep. brands and building sustainable brands here. And your father is the most iconic brand in Bollywood. And there was obviously going to be the comparisons. And how do you then create a position for yourself? How do you then create a differentiator for yourself that you're not constantly going to be compared to your father? Because you cannot then outlive the brand that your father has created. And perhaps that's been the downside of your career, wouldn't you say? Um, it's very simple actually um, I, I'm married to an actor as well Yes. and um, our lives and our, our, our paths have been um, very different whereas she you, you, could, you could you know draw a similarity between her being a startup company and me being a, a business house that I inherited the business um, so that, that's a nice analogy I'm a startup company and I just take myself the business family yeah I thought of that on the flight, by the way. <laughs> okay. well, what other things you know, I want to what I said, I'm going to say. No, so, um, so, um, you know, it was, uh, when, when my first film was about to start, and um, I went, uh, I was shooting in, in a town called Bhuj, which is in uh, the Kutch region of Gujarat. It was a movie called Refugee, and uh, I remember the first three, four days when I was shooting my director, Mr. J.P. Dutta, I didn't, um, do any work with me. To call me on set, I used to get ready and I used to just wait. Mm. And with each day, you know, the that proverbial sword that was hanging on top of my head that this is when it's going to start, your nerves just keep building up until I was absolute wreck. And on the fifth or sixth day, um, I remember the sun was going down and I said, this is rubbish, I can't get ready every day and wait for this. It's like being on death row, you know. <laughs> and um, I took off my makeup and everything and I, and I was going to uh, the bus to, to go back uh, to our hotel when suddenly one assistant dad came running and said, your shot is ready. And I had removed my makeup, taken off my costume, everything. And, and I said, yeah, but I'm, I've got to do my makeup. And I went, no, sun is going, let's go. And in films you have to know, when the light is going in the evening, it's chaos. It's absolute chaos. They work at a snail's pace the entire day. Last 15 minutes, it's like you can finish the film. Mm. So I sprint on to set. And uh, JP Sub says, uh, come on, do the shot. And I, I, I was just a passing shot. Because if any of you all have seen Refugee, uh, there was a lot of passing going on in that. So <laughs> all I was doing was running from one side to the other. And that was pretty much the first three days of me being an actor. After which, I become the complete opposite. I thought Martin Brando had arrived, you know. I'm like, this is easy. I just have to walk from here to here. It's simple. Until he gave me my first dialogue. And that was three pages. Do you and, remember it? Uh, thankfully, no. <laughs> 
Uh, I remember the first line because I had become so uh, brackish by then of three, three days of just doing passing shots that I said, this is easy, man. What are people making a big deal out of this? Uh. You know, pick up a jerry can, a stick over here. Okay, go, that's it, easy. And um, Sandeep, this dialogue came and he said, you know, uh, JP Saab's father used to write the dialogues. He said, sit with dad and learn the dialogues. I reclined, you know. Yeah, go ahead. And he was reading the scene out to me and I was like, okay. And the shot was set up and um, Sandeep, he said, action. And Kulbushan Prabhandaji was opposite me and he had to say, Barkhudar Kumar Naam Kya Hai. And I looked at him and said, Naam? Refugee. And so JP Saab said, you know, just do it while you're filling water in some earthen pots. So I said, okay. So, so you be, I'm sorry. But yeah, don't worry. I can't remember the same way. Barkhudar Kumar Naam Kya Hai. Naam? Refugee. There was an awkward silence. I'm like, my shot must have been really good. He's not cutting it, you know. He's like, wow. And I kept pouring it. I finished the water. And then finally I said, the water's over. He said, when's the rest of your dialogue? <laughs> so I said, that's it. So that's when I realized that he had given me three pages and I just heard the first line. And that's when the panic, uh, you know, set in. Because then I started noticing that there were close to 10,000 people on set. People from neighboring villages had come in on tractors. Because they heard that Amitabh Bachchan's son is making his first film. And suddenly that 10,000 became a million, you know, in my mind. And suddenly the whole way to the world came in. And everybody was like, you know, I, I remember the, my co-actors were there. Mm. And uh, a lot of them had worked with my dad. And um, somebody who I considered to be a guru of mine, Mr. Anubam Kher, because I trained uh, under him, he was one of my teachers, was there as well. And he was panicking. Mm. So that is froze. And I was just picture. I was just picturing in my mind that they're going to call a rap. They're going to go back to the hotel. In those days, we had no mobile that worked in Gooch. so everybody was there was a PC or there used to be a line outside. And so they're all going to call my dad and say, "Forget about it. Send him away somewhere else. He's horrible." And um, it, I started panicking. They wouldn't do that, would they? Oh, <laughs> yeah, they would. They wouldn't do that. Oh yeah, they would. Oh yeah, they would. And and I I just I, I became a rap. And uh, I remember. After, I think, my 17th retake or 18th retake, mm. J.P. Saab realized that I, was, I just lost the plot. So he completely locked off the set, threw everybody off. It was just Kulbushanji, me, J.P. Saab, and the cinematographer. And he said, um, listen, I'm going to keep you here till you do it, right? So you take as much time as you want. And uh, don't worry about anything else and just, just go for it. And the next take after that, I became comfortable. It was, it was fine. Mm. I, and on my drive back, I was thinking... But the main reason I, I froze was because I was just thinking, what are these people going to go tell my father? You know, there I was, I was a 21, 22 year old. Do you still live with that fear? Uh, no, no. I, because at that, during that drive, I, 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 I realized that if I'm just going to be thinking about how am I going to live up to the legacy that my father has and the name and the respect and the talent that he has, I'm not going to be able to do my job. Because at that point of time, I should have been concentrating on my shot, uh, on what my dialogues were, what my motivation for that scene is. In, instead, I was just thinking about, oh my God, you know, Amitabh Jaya Bachchan son, complete failure. Um, so that's when I just learned to just compartmentalize and it blocked it off. And uh, since then, I've never thought about that. And so that's never come in the way uh, for me as an actor. I've always, my parents have never enforced anything onto me. Sure. Uh, they've never made a film for me. They've always allowed me to make my Would mistakes. you like them to make a film for you? Uh, for emotional reasons, uh, it'll be nice. I mean, I feel very proud that uh, my, my, my father never lost me. Uh, he unfortunately was going through a lot of financial difficulties with his company. So we, were, we didn't have the, um, the means to produce a film. Uh, I produced a film for him in a movie called Pa. Ah, yeah. And um, I mean, it would have been it, I mean, something nice to say, but I, I think it's... I take it as a matter of pride that I, I, you know, made my own foray into the film industry. Um, and, um, yeah, Amitabh Bachchan's son. Yeah, thanks. And, and you made your own foray into the very film industry. Very very <laughs> you are Amitabh Bachchan's son. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, um, no, what I'm saying is, um, I'm, I'm very clear. I am who I am today. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Ashish is here and Tanmay is here. Yeah, I, 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 I'm coming to you guys in a bit, Ashish and Tanmay, but, but you preempted my question because why so, do you... Yeah, so I am what I am because of him sure. and my mom. 
uh, for biological reasons as well as other reasons. Um, you know, um, if, if they hadn't gotten together, I wouldn't be here. That's, I mean, that's a given. But obviously, I am his son, and people are going to be interested in seeing me. And I remember Mr. Yash Chopra told me at the premiere mm. of Refugee. He said, uh, well done, congratulations, beta. Ashirwad, I've known him since I was born. And he said, remember, your father brought you to here. After the first show, it's all you. Because it doesn't matter whose son you are, nobody's going to spend money on you because you're somebody else's son. They'll go see your father's son. That's true. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't think about the whole thing about him being a brand mm. because he is who he is and you can't take that away from him. And he's worked hard for it, he's earned it and he, and he deserves it. Uh, you have to do and make your own place under the sun. So since you're talking about making your own place under the sun, you talked about how you try to compartmentalize the fact that you're Abhish uh, Abhita Bachchan's son and uh, chart your own course in Bollywood. Is the attempt now at entrepreneurship, your effort to really find your own voice, to find your own feet, to find your own place under the sun, so to speak? No, I just and love and it. Why, why? No, I just love it. It's, you just uh, love it. Yeah. And you have the cash. You know, uh, no. <laughs> no, um, actually I don't. Um, when, to be very honest, sports is something that I've been as passionate about as acting mm -hmm. uh, for my school days. I, I was a sportsman in school. Um, and um, I've always wanted to do something in sports in mm -hmm. India because I really feel our sporting culture is very weak mm -hmm. and there is an attitude over here that sports is just fooling around when I actually take it very seriously. Sure. And um, if you've seen any of the Kabaddi matches of football, yeah. I mean, I get into it. I get a lot of stick from the uh, opposing fans, but that's good. You know, I think that, that's healthy for to grow the sport. Mm -hmm. But um, when Kabaddi came about, Charu met me... Um, two, three years ago, Charu Sharma, who, yeah. who conceptualized the Pro Kabaddi League. And um, I've obviously known who he is, and we met uh, socially at, at his dinner, and he said, hey, I know you're a big basketball and football fan, have you ever thought of uh, Kabaddi? And very honestly, it was, it was a very left field kind of a thought, I'm like, Kabaddi, you mean people still play that? And he said, yeah, you know, you should go check out a match. So we went and saw a Kabaddi match mm. in Mumbai, and there were, there were like, 5,000 people in a room like this and it was exhilarating. I'm like, my God, this, this sport just needs to be professionalized. Mm. And he said, that's exactly what I'm doing. Would you like to come on board? So I said, uh, Charu, I don't have the means to, I mean, because our standard at that point of time is the idea. So he said, no, no, we're making something a lot more... Um, frugal. Yeah, frugal, yeah. 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 So um, put it this way, you know, You've uh, just bought for what, 16 crores yeah. this year? Uh, my salary cap for my entire team last year in the auction was 60 lakhs. So um, it was something which I felt, okay, I'll sign two, three films and hopefully I can do this. Um, I haven't asked money for my dad since I, uh, since I turned 21. So, um, and he was very clear. He said, I said, look, this is what I'm trying to do. He said, are you sure? I said, I believe in it. Uh, my gut tells me it's going to work. Uh, I have to give it all. Um, so I went out there, signed a couple of films. Um, worked hard for them, made that money, and I run my team purely uh, through my earnings. Unlike some of my, you know, co-franchisees in uh, in Kabaddi, they're huge corporates. I mean, they probably run Kabaddi and you know that advertising budget for two days. But this is like two years of mine, uh, you know, doing four or five films and putting it together. But I enjoy it. Uh, it excites me. Um, I had a great start. Yes, th thankfully, it was a great start. We won the first Pro Kabaddi League. So it wasn't something that, that was just lying around, it was something I believed in and I really believe that's how you should start, I mean there's so many people here that have started new companies and it wasn't like, oh I have some extra cash, let me throw some around. No, you believe in your product, uh, you're passionate about it and you, you have the confidence that I can make this work. I mean without confidence nothing's going to happen. So. Uh, that's, the, that's what I did. But was there no nervousness because as you pointed out yourself, your father had a disastrous business career. Uh, the company uh, was virtually bankrupt. No, uh, it was bankrupt. It was bankrupt. Uh, was so were we. <laughs> so was there, was there, yeah, we were. So was there no fear in your mind of wanting to get back into business of some sort? Well, if we were all scared of everything, I don't think anybody would be sitting here today. Um, there comes a time in life where you have to stick your neck out and just do what you believe in. Um, and my parents also have always taught my sister and, and myself that, you know, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to fall down, but, um, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you fall down, what matters is the amount of time you can pick yourself up mm. and carry on, and, and that's, I believed in this, and this is something I was very determined to make a go of, and, um, yeah, my world came crashing down because we had our first match in Mumbai against Mumbai, and we got thrashed, 
and I, I, I went home and I was up on my team, wait, what just happened, you know, I, if, if this goes like this, I've had it. Uh, but thankfully the team was brilliant, they pulled it up and um, we won the first league and uh, as of this afternoon, you know, um, not only have I covered my loss of, loss of last year in terms of my investment, I've, I'm going to make a profit. In well, Kabaddi, that's how well it did, thankfully, it has nothing to do with me, but I'm glad. So thank how, that's how, big, how big a profit is it? Uh, well, it, it co in comparison, it's, it's, I mean, compared to what some of these guys must be making, <laughs> it's meager, but um, yeah, so I, I covered my, my entire investment of last year mm -hmm. and of this year, and I've made a good one to throw profit. Well, why not that? So, Karate is done, football is done, what's next? Is there a plan? There is, but I think it's a bit too premature, uh, but you have to start working towards it. I'd love to bring, my original love in sports is basketball, mm -hmm. and um, I'd love to do something with basketball in India, but I think we and have... Indian basketball league? Uh, we, we have many uh, uh, school level leagues. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if starting a league is the right way to go right now or maybe get the NBA down. They were here in December. I had dinner with, the, with Adam Silva, who's the commissioner. They're very keen to do something with India. And now with, um, you know, Satnam Singh, who's yeah. of Indian origin, <laughs> signing, being drafted by the Dallas Mavericks, it's huge. I mean, he's a 19-year-old kid, and you have to see, uh, we follow each other on Facebook. So uh, it's actually interesting. He showed me photographs of his house, and he literally lives in a shed. And today he signed with one of the biggest uh, teams in, in NBA history. And it's a great, great story, and I think he's going to be a huge inspiration. Not just him, we have another um, gentleman called Sid Buller, who plays for Sacramento yeah. Kings, who's from Toronto, but is of Indian descent. And uh, these guys can really, you know, change uh, the perception of basketball. The great thing about basketball is, it's got a lot of his work cut out. We don't have, every school in India doesn't have a football pitch, mm -hmm. or a kabaddi uh, pitch. Uh, we, they all have a basketball court. They play cricket on it, but there's a basketball <laughs> court. So you know your 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 infrastructure is there. So I think um, not now. I, I would say another five years down the line. I, I I do hope that I can try and make a difference there. And another thing which everybody thinks I'm joking. I'd love to do is to is to professionalize Coco. Professionalize Coco. Yeah. I think I I was seeing it on television on Doordarshan the other day. It's great fun, you know. And um, so yeah, I don't know. I, it's just a thought. Uh, but the first priority for mine uh, in another two years, uh, hoping that the finances will still keep going the way they are Kabaddi to start the women's Kabaddi league because mm -hmm. it's actually one of the few sports where um, if you see the Indian national team the men's Indian national team actually trains with the women's because they're as good mm -hmm. and it's one of the few sports where um, the level of play is almost similar yeah and that's fantastic and, I mean when we when we, we our preseason is going on in Jaipur and a lot of the local uh, club uh, women's clubs come in and, and practice and they're fantastic and that would be good fun to watch. No, absolutely. And we will support you every step of the way as far as that effort is concerned. Before I turn to the audience, and I know we've got a lot of people here with questions for you. So is this a conscious attempt at reinventing brand button? No. Because yes, I've, got, I've got the resume, 50-odd films, awards, and you're part of the 100 Crow Club and so on and so forth. But this seems to me... First of all, I really want to know where this club is because we should go get a drink there. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah, there's no such thing. We all sit, no, really? Yeah. That's what I'm saying? No. Yes, no. Yes, every day I tell them that this kind has made it to the 100 crore club and yeah. that kind has made it. Yeah. Yeah. This button has made it to the 100 crore club. That's true, but who tells you that? You do. So. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. we, yeah. Okay. I'm going to say something about what you guys did in NSCI, by the way. Okay. Yeah. I can see that there's exciting times following uh, this. this answer, answer my question that I'll throw to um, you know, it, it wasn't initially, it was just something I wanted to do. Mm. Um, and then when it started and took off, it obviously makes you introspect when a lot of these people are going to start their new companies. I'm sure they do it out of love and passion. Yes. And then they realize, hey, wait a second, this is something bigger than what I, uh, you know, visioned it to be. And that's when you introspect and say, okay, this, is, this could, could be um, a repositioning or an emergence of a new brand. Um, I started thinking along those lines in this season. Um, I never did the first season because the first season you just wanted to work. Mm -hmm. uh, now that it's been successful by the grace of God, uh, you start thinking of how can you grow it? Yeah. Uh, how can you make it into a, a lucrative brand? So you start bringing a business model into it. Um, which is that pretty much 
I think how any creative person would have approached it. I wish uh, I had the approach of a, of, of a business house, which would have set up a business plan and a business model first. But in your mind, it now makes more strategic sense to go in this direction as opposed to Bollywood. No, 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 no. no. You're not giving up on that. Absolutely not. Tough luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. So, um, no. Um, I love making films. I love entertaining the audiences, the ones I get entertained by my films. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's primarily what I do. This is uh, my hobby. Uh, this, is, this is your hobby for now, it may be different a couple of years down. This, this is sure. also, a, it has to grow organically on some level and That's it's going to become thing. bigger than just me. Right now, I micromanage everything. Mm -hmm. You know, from what's going to go out on Instagram from the team to what, what they'll be wearing to how they're going to eat and what, what they'll travel. I micromanage everything with, with my manager, Bunty, who's here, who uh, manages the team with me. And we literally look into every detail. Every evening we get a, a, like a success report of this is what the boys did today and this is what they need. Um, there's going to come a time where I'm not going to be able to do that. You mm -hmm. have to take it to a macro level. You have to get in people who are going to be able to run yeah, the boys. especially if you're scaling it up. Absolutely. All right, let me turn over to questions. Uh, I'm going to come to you in just a second. The folks from AIB have been waiting here for questions. You're, you're already mic, so go ahead, Sunday and uh, Ashish. If you can just stand up, sorry, Tanmay, so, so the cameras can, can catch you as well. Is that, is Tanmay on my now? And, and don't get, don't get uh, thrown by what the media talks about them. These two are truly very talented writers. They've written a lot of stuff for me, so well done, guys. Well, Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know the media was saying otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were. I don't know if we were waiting to ask questions until Shireen said that they were waiting to ask questions. <laughs> 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 Fill the theater, but today 
You have these 50 seaters, 300 seaters. Uh, we have an audience which is exposed to a cinema like Yoda that are willing to see the, those kind of films and your choices have changed. So you get the opportunity to make them. So I think it's just a, a change in culture. I don't think there, you know, uh, anything apart from that. Keep in mind, my 50 pounds of the world who will be building basketball in India would you do the next year's roast? <laughs> You know, very honestly, uh, you all asked me this two years ago and my answer is going to be pretty similar. I don't need you to roast me. I roast myself on a daily basis. Have you seen my <laughs> uh, Having said that, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I don't know. Um, I think you have to do something. I mean, just I, I've spent a lot of evenings chatting with you on a lot of scripts we've written for some of the award shows and all. And I think you have to start something newer than the roast. You know, let the Americans handle that. You have to do something like because your, your brand of humor is fantastic. And unfortunately, you all have been bracketed into just the guys who ARA or they roasted. But there, there's so much more than that. These guys are genuinely very funny. And they're great directors as well. We actually worked on, were working on a script which I wanted them to direct. And um, I, I, I would hope that you would say, okay, this is what we want to do, and I'll, I'll do that for you. So that's a no to the roast, then, man. That's a no to the roast. <laughs> <laughs> It's a gathering of entrepreneurs here. You did a movie called Go, you know. I, I love that movie. Thank you. Thank you for that movie. Oh, thank you. You acted fantastically well in that movie. Like, how did you prepare being an entrepreneur? How did you read through the stories of Dhirubhai Ambani? Uh, well, I... Um, and how was the experience in that? I, 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 I did... Um, do they still do O-levels and A-levels over here? GCSEs and... No, so, we don't have the O levels and the A levels, but yes, we have the equivalent of all examinations. Yeah, so I have O level and A level economics. Because, uh, I mean, when I was doing them, then A levels and O levels were getting a bit yeah. uh, outdated. So I did economics, so I knew, I, I know my basic demand and supply. Um, it's, it's a film. Uh, when you have a character, um, the thing with, with Mani Ratnam, who is the director of the film, is he doesn't like his actor to come overtly prepared. And that was my second film with Money. I'd done a movie called Yuba with him the year before. And Money likes to just, you know, sit and just talk. And then this, he liked the human side of everything. So in Guru, we were more about the character. It wasn't about what he was necessarily doing. It was more a human story. Um, but I did watch, um, you know, I tried, the thing I was most nervous about was doing the AGM. Um, so I, I watched some films of doing AGMs and i have been to a couple uh, for, for my company as well. Um, so that was about it, you know. Uh, I wanted to make Guru Khan Desai very approachable. I wanted him to be very human. I didn't want people to look up to him. I wanted people to feel that they could put their arm around and say, Guru Mahi Gencho, you know, can you tell us this? So that was our approach towards him, to make him very human and tactile. Um, did I learn anything about entrepreneurs from that? I think the one thing that film taught me was, you know, go out there and dream big and just follow it. There's no rules. Uh, and if there's a rule, break them. But be lawful, guys, please. <laughs> yes, we have time only for very few questions because we're running over. Yes, go ahead. I'm not going to take too much time because I don't have a you question. You can just hold the microphone. Yeah, I don't have a question as such. Um, Abhishek, you need to start flying private with Jet Set Go. You have your own plane waiting for you. When you want it, which will get you here in time. <laughs> All right. Then. Okay, then for your take off, I need to go to Brisbane. You need to give me a credit card details. Sure. Sure. Okay, what is going to be? I'm going to tweet about it. You can fly me to Brisbane. for free. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 They've not worked well, right? So, as an entrepreneur, how important do you th uh, think that the success that you had in some couple of movies and the failure you had in rest, how they have helped you evolve as a better businessman? How how have they done? So it's very it's very simple. Success um, deals with you. You can't deal with it. You have to deal with the failure, and. Um, the kind of learning that you come out of from a failure is far superior to a success. Alright? Um, 
life is tough. Life is not fair. Um, a lot of you would have done stuff that hasn't worked, but you'll have come out stronger and better uh, entrepreneurs through that experience. The one thing it teaches you is what not to do, um, what you could have done better. Uh, unfortunately, in life, we only realize what we could have done better after we've done it. In ours, I mean, when we're working on a film, you've spent a good year working on a film, heart and soul. Um, you're so in immersed in it that you don't get to see it objectively. But then when you put it out there for the audience, they take a decision on it. And you have to um, accept that. And if it doesn't work, it teaches you a lot more. Uh, and especially in my profession and in my industry, um, you know, success can get to you. You know, it's, it's, it, it's tough. Um, I remember I, I made my first successful film, which was a movie called Dhoom in 2004. And I remember I got my first positive reaction from the audiences, and it's, it's exhilarating. It puts you on top of the world. You know, just one person coming up and saying, you know, we love the film, it's fantastic. And I, I took a moment to arrive, and all the way, okay, you know, I've, I finally arrived, and I, I walked home with a swagger, I rang the bell, and my dad opened the door. And that entire ego just got a bit deflated, because, you know, I, I go home to Amitabh Bachchan, and <laughs> how big can you be? So, um, but what I realized is that, is that when, you, when you do something and it's unsuccessful, uh, you come out a stronger person. A stronger person because um, it makes you resilient because you have to face it. And I've never tried to run away from any of my failures. I've made quite a few of them. Uh, you've got to stand there, take it on the chin, and move on. And um, you have to learn to, to be able to improve upon that. And the inspiration should be, okay, I messed up. Uh, if I'm going to get another chance, I'm going to make sure I don't mess up. And that should keep you uh, waking up in the morning and working hard. So that's the way you have to be positive about it. You know, as humans, we, we tend to get very bitter and demoralized. That's something you have to really work hard for that not to seep into you. So um, I, I really do hope and pray that you never have to face those kind of days. And I hope all of you are very successful. Uh, but, you know, once in a while, they always say you have to have one kala tikka for nazar. It's good. I have quite a few kala tikkas, but... <laughs> Well, Abhishek Bachchan, we could continue this conversation. Yeah, I know, I know. Unfortunately, I She told me she can fly me whenever I want to. I'm comfortable. You want to talk to me, we can say that all night. I would love to, but unfortunately, we've got a show to run. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute My pleasure speaking with you. Thank I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Abhishek, request you to kindly. Thank you so much. Request you to kindly accept that token of appreciation from Titan. So you get a free plate right and a water. There you go. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thanks, Abhishek. Thanks, Shri. Our next speaker or speakers for the evening are part of the quartet who have created a business that worked and more importantly, one that paid well where there was none earlier. They've had their share of admirers and critics. We bring you Tanma Bhaganashi Shakya for disrupting the Indian comedy scene with AIB. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Tanmay Bhai and Ashish Shagya.
production company. Uh, we work with brands now. Uh, we are primarily writers and comedians. We start off. It's still bad. It's, it's okay now. It's okay. Yeah. Everybody got up?
try to we try to talk about things that we generally would react to even if you weren't comedians. Uh, and one of the things that we really enjoyed is Bollywood. At that point, while we were on YouTube, this is in the early days, uh, Bollywood and YouTube didn't have a very nice uh, relationship. The popular Bollywood movie studios uh, had, had often had the habit of banning down and taking down and banning videos that made fun of their movies. This was the culture. Uh, all of these papers are all legends, like, hey, who wants to come down? I'm not sure if you're going to have a video again. There was this really weird culture on YouTube where Bollywood studios would often not want people to parody their movies. At one, one day, we wanted to parody uh, one of Abhishek's movies, Tom 3. Uh, and the trailer had just come out. And all we wanted to do was take the trailer, put it out, put out, watch those on it, and do a parody video. Except we wanted Yashwasman's permission to do it. Because why not? Why can't I make a joke about your film? Why is there this attitude that our films are untouchable? Yeah. So it's not just making a video and putting it up and having it banned and then downloading and putting it somewhere else. We said, why don't we just go and talk to Yashwas films? Let's tell them, hey guys, we're using this this footage that you guys have, and I just want to make a bunch of jokes. You decide what jokes can even go into the script. I just want to put out a parody video that is okay with the studio. That's all I want. Because if one studio does it, then you know that five more studios would get into it. Unfortunately, Yashra saw us out of building saying, you guys are college kids and you don't educate people in shops. And, uh, and we came out and we said, you know what, we still want to talk about, we still want to address this culture. So we decided, let's drop the boundary spoon, let's write a song about what happened to us. Can we have the video? This was a huge moment for us because um, this essentially changed Bollywood's relationship uh, with this film. The internet is made up with more than three parodies and mashups, but not the idea. Because here, studios get grumpy and take these parodies down. For example, this race to in November, AIB decided to have fun with a trailer mashup for Drone 3. Respectful of Yashraj's copyright over the trailer, we made multiple requests to Yashraj, offered to modify jokes, and even let them make money off our video. We just had one request. Please don't ban the video, just let it exist. But Yashraj told us to drop the idea completely and never bring it up again. And then they alerted the anti piracy cell. So the following song, Straight from the Heart, is dedicated to grumpy old Bollywood. <laughs>
they have no money. Let's try and do this and see what happens. You want to say something, Ashish? 
No, that's that's about it. I think the ratio was way better. The ratio yeah. was way better. It's just that uh, the negative news got amplified so much, and everybody like was we mentioned yeah. earlier that these are just the guys who did the roast, and people screaming at us all saying, "No, man, we do other stuff as well." Yeah. You know, we tell them immediately after. This is the next slide. On the internet, uh, for weeks on before the before the PRAI uh, had come out with their consultation paper, for weeks, internet activists were screaming their voices hoarse, saying net neutrality is in danger. Net neutrality. I, I hope you guys know what net neutrality is by now. Uh, net neutrality is uh, your right to access every kind of information on the internet uh, at the same at the same level. No access. No, there should be no preferential access to whatever data that you're going to consume. At that time, internet activists were yelling their, their voices through the roof, trying to get attention from mainstream media, saying, can we talk about it? This is important to us. Let's talk about it. But of course, uh, you pay roughly the same amount of attention to internet activists as Arvind Kejriwal does to Prashant Bhushan. And, and nobody paid attention then. Uh, which, is, which is when they contacted us and saying, hey guys, here's something uh, that we are really passionate about. And we realized at that point, we roughly just got a million subscribers. And we realize there's a huge, there's a huge database of people who watch our videos, young people who just don't understand this information. The TRAI, luckily, on that day, came out with a 118-page consultation paper, which nobody could understand. Uh, it, was it was very deep in their website somewhere. Somewhere in the corner. And that's when we realized, let's try and see what our reach can do. So we simplified. We sat for three days straight. We went through the whole consultation paper with the help of the folks at, uh, at and and yeah. a lot of other people just crowdsourced and. Well, we went through it and we said, let's just put out a simplified version of what this means. And our target was 15,000 emails to be sent to the TRAI. Uh, we did a million in some eight, eight or days and it turned into a national debate. It was on, I mean, I was on Agnar's show, which is, yeah. So, I need to speak on it, which is yeah. the real miracle. Once you're on Agnar's show, then your life is uh, at a different level. And uh, yeah. see, these people can yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so once mainstream media picked it up, uh, the government had to react. And then I saw newspaper headlines saying center likely to not, uh, not uh, ruin net neutrality. Uh, and that's when we realized that, okay, this yeah. reach can be... Uh, There's something about uh, simplifying and sending a message across with you and that gets it across to people, especially young people. You take a complex issue and, I mean, you present it well, they listen to you. And is, that, is, that it? Is, that, is that all we have? Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's that this was, this was roughly a month ago. We hadn't done something amazing to brag about right after that. So we'll tell you, we saw it. But yeah, I think the core takeaway, core takeaway for us has always been if you genuinely believe, as cliche as it sounds, if you genuinely believe in something uh, and, you, and you put that foot forward, more often than not, it will work for you. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for, for calling us here. Thank actually. you. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Any, any questions for the board of I just get so scared when people ask us questions. Thank you. Hey, uh, hi, Tanmina. Hi. This is Siddharth. Yeah. So, you know, I think I speak for everyone. We all big fans of your comedy. You uh, don't, don't speak for everyone, you know. <laughs> you don't get to do that. <laughs> so, probably everyone in my circle, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. So, we're all big fans. And uh, in fact, I used to watch you guys before AIP happened and, you know, live in IIT and other venues. Awesome. So, yeah. just wanted to know you guys have obviously managed to capture the online space. And, but comedy is even better for life, right? So what plans, if any, for offline? And how to take forward that offline comedy movement in India, which is still very nascent? Ooh, I, I believe we've, we've, we've gone on record multiple times saying that the eventual goal is, is comedy school in India. That's the, that's the eventual goal. Uh, and, I th and I think I disagree when, when you say that while the online stuff is happening and it's growing at a rapid pace, the offline is suffering. I, 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 don't, I don't think that. I think the online aids the offline immensely. Uh, I think comedians will, will testify to this. What's happened to us especially uh, is people saw us online and they start coming to our live shows. And every time they come from a live show, they discover two other comedians with us who are on stage. And then they get discovered and so on and so forth. Uh, if you notice now, every comedian is, is on YouTube now. It's, it's for this precise reason. I think YouTube aids, aids live comedy. I think the more uh, ad, the fewer ads you skip, the better it is for live comedy. That's how I put it. Um, uh, this is of course I'm being extremely uh, <laughs> biased towards the whole channel. <laughs> but please guys, the overall message you should take back from today is uh, like, comment and subscribe. Please do that. And please guys, so everybody know to keep liking and commenting and subscribing. It's for me guys, it's for free speech, for free speech. Hi guys. Hi. Um, so I have a very small question. How are you looking at monetizing whatever you're doing? You're doing it really well. Uh, what I see is like, for example, TVF is a competitor in this space, right? It's one of those people who started it uh, you know, three, four years back. 
and they already started creating their own properties, TVF Play, TVF Inbox, XYZ. Yeah. Uh, how do you plan to monetize this? Because I think, and probably this is a feedback also, that's where AIB is lacking in terms of uh, generating uh, their own properties. You mean, you, mean a, you mean our own platform? A absolutely. Like, okay. you do not depend on a third party like YouTube. Okay. Right. Well, the, the, the yeah. option of going and doing our own platform was something that we've all been considering. Uh, the good thing about what we do is uh, there's not too many players doing what we do. What that means is an opportunity that someone else gets, everybody else automatically gets it. Uh, if there's someone going to put money somewhere else, if once they're done, who will go to? You have to come to us. Uh, so I think the key for us is when we are ready for it, uh, the last thing we want to do is jump the gun. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to monetizing, uh, well, there are two or three things that we do. One, of course, there's the online platform. Secondly, we have a very strong live division. We do a lot of live shows. Uh, which is how we began. So that's some that's a constant uh, income. And thirdly, we've now uh, we've now reached a point where brands speak to us a lot more than what we ever imagined. Uh, so now we have we have a very good team who works purely on uh, purely on creating content for brands. Basically, on advertising agencies ka kam chura hai at the at the basically. So we get to the it annoys me when I see 50 years trying to tell clients what young people are watching on the internet. Uh, at the very heart of it, it's that. We now have a very good team in place who understands how the internet functions. Uh, so yeah, so if any advertisers are out there, we're, we're coming to steal your work and all the best dealing with uh, dealing with us. Um, hi guys, I'm Shivangi. Yeah. Right. Hi. I'm, I'm Shivangi. So you guys are doing a great job and I really like a few parts of the AIB or roast video also. Thank, Thank you. you. Not not putting you guys into trouble, just one simple question. What about the black clothes guys? That's what about the? Black clothes, like the black shirt. The black clothes. Uh, because comedians are totally known for themselves. So thank you. Yeah, I think it'll be nice. What are you talking about clothing? It's just completely No, this is, this is our trying to look slimmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to be nice. This is This is not going to be nice. 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 No, I should be able to do that. That was not going on. This is me talking about what's the shirt press. Any more questions? That was a very, very incisive business question. I was like, I'm really glad. I'm really glad that happened. I'm, uh, put me in a spot of conundrum now. I'll be thinking about this for days now. I've got all my kind of business all over the day. She spoke about a shirt, guys. I have to get on this right now. Uh, hi, uh, again a big fan. Uh, I have a quick question actually. So, uh, you know, building on the previous question about monetizing, I am sure that you guys are getting a lot of offers from a lot of different, uh, you know, Bollywood uh, personalities and studios and etc. Uh, and I'm sure monetizing becomes easy once those offers start coming in. Uh, but you guys clearly have been saying no to a lot of those offers. So is there a core principle that you're trying to protect? Any kind of core identity that you feel uh, will get lost if you give in to that uh, monetization request? It's a daily debate, man. It's a daily debate. Uh, uh, it's my it's my gross misfortune that I work with three other really principled, <laughs> extremely smart people. Uh, so very often they're not, uh, I'm not playing devil's advocate and I get shut down. No, but yeah, it's, it's a debate that you have often. For example, after the net neutrality issue, uh, if, if any telco comes to us and says we need to pay him money to do some work for us, we're like, are you a part of this very big platform or no? Like, it's a, we may have to question them five times before we get associated. Uh, but that's the thing, if you want to take a stand, it eventually affects your business, but we're okay with that. Uh, I mean, I think the audience is eventually going to see through it, and our real investment, our real strength is essentially the audience that was, that's what's yeah. been carrying us so far. So, yeah. you can't like with it, see through it. There are good see through it. There are good moments where really big movie stars, uh, like their people will email us saying, this is called Video Chie, or this time will come, this picture will come. So, you tell us what, whatever money is, we'll figure it out. And when we reply saying, hey guys, I don't think we're interested to plug the movie, uh, but if you, if you just want to do a video, let us know, we'd be happy to come in and jam and figure something out. And, the, in creative involvement is the same. I'm not going to write a script for you, come to you and say, sir, take those. No, let's talk about what you want to talk about. Uh, uh, when when such things happen, the immediate reaction from there is like, how dare you say no to him? Have you seen his surname? And uh, it, it gets it gets bizarre at times because there are times like these uh, where, you, where you end up meeting these people. Uh, but I think that sucks. Uh, no, 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 So I think the core is to really start trusting your audience a little more. 
Uh, and we start seeing that some of the other channels they start getting a lot of movie stars to promote their films. And suddenly they start getting, getting these emails at night like, because a lot of fan mail after 9 30, 10 pm is when students get introspective and they're nostalgic at night. So students are in their, in their uh, rooms and they're looking and they start, they send these really just bad emails like, yeah, full respect, yeah. You know, so now we're not that bad, yeah. They read some Russian power on Nancy Martini and they'll send you one. Old Mark leads to some great insights. Yeah, so. <laughs> No, those are the best moments, man. Like, that's that's pretty much my whole job. Like, with uh, obnoxious uncle at an airport coming and touching you when you don't want him to, you know. But that, that's what I'm going to do. 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 That's what I'm yeah, it's really nice. But yeah, there, there are some restraints and there are some things that we got to live by. Yeah. So the show that must not be named, how yeah. has that changed your approach? Are you now going over scripts? Are you looking at what you're saying? How has that changed how you function on stage or even um, online? We will always, uh, see, I think again, it comes back to us being defined as the people who did the roast. Now you have to understand that the roast is a form of comedy called insult comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so now, but apart from the bad, apart from that, the stuff we write and we always. So how are you dealing with the unintended consequences of the road? Yeah. Put it so I'll be honest, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the first month was pouring out every word that we were saying because we knew the spooky was so high that anything could spark off uh, a conversation. Uh, but it's been a few months now, and while it began with constant mortal fear, uh, now we're at a point where we realize that, okay, I, I honestly genuinely think. Uh, that the roast made us grow and evolve as comedians more than anything else, and I think that's important. Uh, so, yeah, so now we're a lot more empathetic, we're a lot, we're a lot sharper with what we write. Uh, and some of the criticism outside of Mira Burger, you should be banned. Some of the other criticism that came our way, I, th- I think it's all, it's all been very good for us. Uh, so now when we sit down and write, write something, we will, we will keep it on what a journalist will say about it five years from now. <laughs> we can think about whether, you know, the 9 xm will buy your thing and annoy you for a bite. Like, you think about these things. Uh, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. I know this joke is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but this, is, this is the process in your office, right? Where they put up thinking, they like, okay, this is the podcast is, you can't do this anymore. Uh, but there is this joke that I really love, and I'm okay, like, I am okay with dealing with the Mosorasia if I have to do that joke. Like, <laughs> for me, that's the right thing. Like, I am okay with talking about her for an hour and then it's going to So there are, you have to pick your battle. You know, uh, I mean, as comedians, you always punch up. There's a, there's a rule in comedy which is you always punch up, which is uh, you always punch upwards towards towards the most superior institution as opposed to punching downwards. Uh, you so make some of your best, basically. Yeah, and uh, we've always followed that. Yeah. Uh, so now I think that's the kind of rule that is a lot more stricter now. I think I think it's a good thing. I think it's, it's making us better comedians. You know, you've named three competitors on a CNBC TV yeah. platform, but we'll still give you dinner because we have a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that the second the video was being edited, but I didn't know that it was bad. Thank you, Tanman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Request you to come yeah. back, sir. That's open of appreciation. We, along with Titans, left the time. She looks Not the best. most unhappy person here. <laughs> She's like, that's what I'm going to die. I have two women are in Korea. They have nice watches. I must add here that this is Sunday's second conclave. He was the stand-up comic act for our first Young Turks conclave in 2010. So we definitely have a good eye for talent. Thank you very much, Sanmay and Ashish. We are trying to invite our final speaker for the evening. Under Arun Sarin's leadership, Vodafone grew to become a global brand with over 300 million customers, produced record revenues and profits, and had a market capitalization of $150 billion. Take a look at his journey. The CEO of Vodafone Group PLC from 2003 to 2008. The driving force behind Vodafone's strategic moves into emerging markets like India, Turkey, and Africa. A global growth leader who expanded Vodafone's product line to include data, internet, and broadband services. CNBC TVA team welcomes Arun Sareen to the Young Turks Conclave 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Arun Sareen, former global CEO of Vodafone PLC. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me?
Jeremy. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I have a very difficult task here because I stand between you and dinner. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to make it brief. Uh, and uh, Shireen has been uh, very kind to invite me here. Uh, happy 14th birthday here. And don't you think we should induct her into this Kabaddi team that Abhishek was talking about? Um, look, my, my message to you is uh, pretty simple today. I, I don't know what phase of entrepreneurship you're involved in here, but I'm just assuming we've got entrepreneurs <coughs> all from startups to sort of kind of semi-mature entrepreneurs doing it for the first, second, or third time. And I come to India once or twice a year. I'm here on a four or five day trip. I've visited uh, 20 or so startup companies here and I've visited with 10 or 12 VCs. Um, and so I just want to reflect on sort of what I'm seeing on this trip. And I think the thing that stands out to me uh, on this trip is that this notion that smartphones, 50 million smartphones today with sort of 3G or any kind of data connection, this number is going to grow to say 500 million at the pace of roughly 100 million a year. This journey has begun. And because there will be 500 million smartphones in India, which is almost half the population of the country in a few years, this is fundamentally going to change the way people work, live, play. Just their daily lives are going to change. And so the, this idea of you know, hyper-local or e-commerce or shopping or payments or health or finance or transportation or whatever else. This is a journey that has begun and will pick up pace as the years go by. This is not sort of a reversible thing anymore. This is not sort of, is it, is it going to happen? It is almost certain that it will happen. You can argue about the face, you can argue about valuation, you can argue about a lot of things. But I think this journey has begun, and frankly, this is not a journey that's just begun here in India. This is a journey that we've been on, on, on for a while in the United States and partially in Europe, but it is gathering steam here because you have inexpensive handsets, you've got data prices that are coming down very quickly in the coming years, You've got fabulous apps that you can use to do very interesting things that make your life you know, helpful and cool and all of that. So my own view is there's a very substantial change taking place in the billion Indian consumers. And if you're an entrepreneur and you're hoping and wanting to sort of change uh, whatever it is you change, whether it's Neeraj's drink or Shaheen's fabulous story and, and the social work she is doing or the entrepreneurship that Abhishek um, exhibited here just a few minutes ago, whatever your field is, there is a chance to kind of rewrite the rules. Because the old rules are not going to apply. Uh, you're going to have to think about new rules. And what are these rules in this kind of smartphone revolution that we are sort of embarking on? The second point I'd make is that, you know, I've observed great leaders over my years in, in business and otherwise, and I find there are certain common traits between great entrepreneurs, great leaders, whether they're political leaders or they're business leaders or they're hospital leaders or financial leaders or educational leaders, sports leaders, whatever the field is, there are certain very basic requirements to be a good entrepreneur or a good leader. And I, having had that experience, I want to share that with you as to what are those core traits. In my judgment, there are three things that you need to do simultaneously to be a great entrepreneur, great leader, whatever. One is you need to have very good strategic skills. 
This doesn't mean that you necessarily have to have an MBA or go to Harvard Business School or work at McKinsey or any of the above. But you have to be able to make the choices that your institution or organization is facing, being able to understand how the world around you is changing. And therefore be able to say, you know, you need to go left or you need to go right or you need to disintermediate this or disintermediate that or have a sense for sort of what the customer really wants. So having good strategic skills is very important. The second thing is you have to have really good operational skills. It's not good enough to just be able to think about an idea. You have to be able to execute. You have to be able to get down into the brass stacks and look at your business and deliver whatever the key metrics that you have to deliver in your business because otherwise you're flying too high and maybe you're not close enough to your customer. You don't know what customer satisfaction really is or what the distribution really is or what kind of finances you're producing. So you have to be operationally oriented as well. And the third thing is you have to have very good human skills. You know, a lot of people either take this for granted or don't think enough about it. And my own view is, at the core, you have to be a pretty good human being. Otherwise, something is going to blow up along the way. And being a good human being, having the ability to sort of motivate your employees in a vision and values and goal sense of the word are absolutely essential because otherwise somewhere along the line you're going to get caught out because you weren't able to motivate or your personal values were not consistent with what you were trying to do. And none of us sort of operates completely by ourselves. We are surrounded by, you know, friends and family and investors and customers and so on and so forth. So it's very important that you be a good human being, that you think about society and what it is you're doing. And so I would just leave those three thoughts with you in terms of sort of strategic skills, operational skills, and human skills all packed into one person. And you're not perfect at all these three at any one time, but you keep practicing and you're conscious of it and you keep trying to be a better leader or a better entrepreneur. My final point today to you before I'll take questions is, you know, you're entrepreneurs in whatever field that you're an entrepreneur in. But think about solving the big problems, the big problems of India. There's no point solving little problems or sort of on the margin, you know, copycat or this or that. Try and solve big problems. There is a lot of pain in a lot of different segments. Find a segment, solve a big pain point. Second, really build a fine, sustainable business. Sustainable customer franchise. Not a flash in the pan, not sort of smoke and mirrors, but sustainable customer franchise. And finally, be a good human being. You know, give back to society, be a good human being, be a good mentor, be a good role model, be a good employee, be a good friend, be a good family member. So I'd say those are the things that were top of mind for me, and I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to kick things off with the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jareen, for joining us no. here at the Young Tech Conclave. Uh, first, of course, there's an announcement because Arun Sareen has joined the board of Ola Cabs. Ola, of course, is a Young Tech as well, so congratulations on that. Why the decision to join the Ola board? Um, the answer is very simple. It's Bhavish. Yes. Um, Bhavish and I have been chatting for a little while, and he was absolutely insistent that I join his board. And in some ways, the things that I said to you just a moment ago were the things that I thought Ola was doing well and was capable of doing at scale, which is solve a big problem. And I think transportation in India is a very big problem. It has nothing to do with 
Ola cabs today. That's the manifestation of what they do today. But if you think about the broad transportation program, pro problem, wouldn't it be good if we didn't have to think about whether my car is here or who am I getting a ride with tonight or whatever the case might be, if I knew I could press an app and within a couple of minutes there would be some form of transport, whether it's a car or an auto rickshaw or a bus or whatever it is that shows up on my screen and I can choose how I decide to get home in a safe and consistent and affordable way. That's, to me, that's the problem that he's solving. So that's a big problem. Yeah, in terms of, you know, sort of build a good company, clearly they've scaled very well so far, but they have sort of miles to go in the future in terms of what it is they're trying to do and the company they're trying to build. I really like the team he has. Um, I like the, the customer franchise that they're building. Um, and finally, it's about people. I mean, I like I liked him. Um, I, I can help him, I think. I'd like to help him, uh, and so here I am joining his board, and we'll see uh, what the journey looks like in the coming years. So is your rendezvous with India going to be investment-driven, or is it only going to be you sharing your expertise and your wisdom at a board level? Are we going to see you actually putting money into Indian startups? Yes. So I think, you know, in fact, I have put money into Ola, um, and I will be looking to invest more in startups in India, um, principally for the reason that I outlined at the outset, which is 50 million smartphones with good data connections going to 500 million smartphones with three 4G connections with data rates coming down. This is going to change the way people live and work and play and all of that. And I think it's a fabulous opportunity. So any specific sectors that you're looking at? Maybe that could be a hint to all these young entrepreneurs here. Any, any, anything in specific that you would be looking at? Any specific pain points that you would be interested in addressing by way of your investment? Um, I don't have any specific thoughts at this stage, but I'll just go back to the point I made earlier, which is solve a big problem, create a great customer franchise, be a good human being, mm -hmm and you'll find plenty of people wanting to invest in your company. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question which is being debated and, and we had AIB talk about net neutrality yeah. and, uh, and keeping the net neutral and at this point in time, we're still awaiting the government regulation on whether or not uh, OTTs like WhatsApp, et cetera, will be licensed in India. I know the telecom industry in India uh, says that at least when it comes to voice services, OTTs should uh, have the same licensing arrangement as, uh, as the telcos do. Do you believe that it's fair uh, to license services like WhatsApp in India? Look, first of all, there is a net neutrality debate that happens in virtually every country. There was a net neutrality debate that happened in the United States. There's a net neutrality debate that's going on in the UK, Germany, Italy. You can go across the world. The specifics of a net neutrality debate are very country specific in terms of just the overall regulation that they have. If it's genuinely net neutral, then it has to be a playing, level playing field for everybody. The government can't be charging one set of competitors certain because certain taxes and tariffs because they happen to be in one bucket and not the other. So I think this is really an opportunity for the government to say, look, we are where we are in the development of the net. Obviously, we all want a good open net. There's no question about that. But there are so many regulations of a voice over IP and this and that and all of that. Can we just clean everything up in one stroke and say, yep, this is the kind of net we want. This is the kind of spectrum policy we want. This is the kind of company we want. And then have at it. The spectrum policy is in place. You've already had a round of auctions. You're going to have another round of auctions. The government ain't doing away with the spectrum policy, sir. So the question is, uh, you know, the telcos are crying foul. Should the government at this point in time uh, levy a anything on, on uh, services like Skype and WhatsApp, for instance? So to be candid with you, I'm not close enough to the puts and takes here in the Indian market. Um, all I would say is this debate occurs in every jurisdiction. And the way this debate gets sorted is by looking at the big picture policies so that you're not favoring one versus the other, but equally you're encouraging competition and you're encouraging an open net.
and you're encouraging the very thing which I said, which is you are going to find that while the cost of data today is roughly $4 a gigabyte in this country, it will fall very dramatically in the coming years. So today people are almost afraid to use their phones because they're not quite sure how much they'll get charged or whatever it is. That is going to fast disappear with the onslaught of sort of coming competition. So my view is it's a very positive thing, whatever is going on. And you'll have entertainment services, you'll have all kinds of services that will be affordable in the coming years. My final question before I get everybody else in on this, and you know what it has to do with the Vodafone retrospective tax issue, right. is, you know, we had a conversation in a similar hotel several years ago, and you said you were hopeful that the Vodafone tax issue would have been resolved under you while you were heading Vodafone. That didn't happen. Right. Uh, would you say that that has been one of the big disappointments of your career? So look, first of all, um, Vodafone is a large company. Um, when we bought into Vodafone India here in 2007, we had 15 million customers. Today we have 175 million customers. The company has grown. The revenues have grown. Is it personally disappointing to me that this case hasn't been resolved? Yes. But as you know, we took the matter up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed with us twice. Then the law was changed. And the law was changed for us and many other companies on a retrospective basis. That certainly sent a chill through the investment community around the world. So actions that policymakers take have consequences, and it's had its set of consequences. I'm very hopeful that over a period of time that there will be some kind of a settlement reached so that everybody can get on with life. Last few questions. All right, then. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Saleem. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> oh, one, yeah. one brave gentleman <laughs> who is now standing between you and dinner. I'm Deepak. Uh, I'm asking when you are putting money in some new, new country, suppose you are expanding your business, when you, I'm asking your board upon experience, if the country suddenly changes its policy, what is your strategy to get out of the country? Okay. Have you ever faced that situation? I just I have to, to tell experience. you, I have not in my career faced a situation where policies have been changed and laws have been changed retroactively. That is sort of the harshness in what is going on here. But look, we are long-term players. Um, and, you know, it, it'll, it'll resolve itself. We are continuing to invest. We are continuing to buy Spectrum. We are continuing to s serve customers. And so it, it'll get resolved. But it's from an investment climate, it doesn't send the right image because people will then say, look, I come invest a lot of money and the policy can change at any minute to my detriment and to the detriment of my shareholders. All the constituents and the shareholders have to win in a system uh, like the one we have. So I haven't faced that ever before, and, um, and obviously it's not the, the sort of the, the finest hour of Indian policymaking. All right, Mr. Sarin, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Request you to accept that token of appreciation from Young right, Sir. Thank you. And Titan Celestial Time. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now come to the end of the sixth Young Turks Conclave, but before we let you go, I would like to uh, take a minute to thank our sponsors. Young Turks Conclave is sponsored by ICICI Securities and Titan Celestial Time, our startup partner, NASCOM 10,000 Startups, our gift partners from the Young Turks family, Poster Gully, Gift Zozo, Organic Harvest, and V Resorts. We are proud to be associated with each one of you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and hope you had a great and great evening. Please do join us for cocktail and dinner and do not forget to collect your goodie bags which are there at the registration counter. Thank you so much.
where breaking the rules means also, building them. We also have a mug where rebels, you can get yourself printed. Thank you. They're just outside in that speaker room. Thank you. Changes every day. CMC TV 18 Young Turks Conclave 2015 celebrates the disruptors who are pushing the boundaries, breaking the mold, and changing the way we do business with their bold new strategies. This July in New Delhi. In partnership with Mercedes Benz, the best or nothing. Titan, your time has come. The dinner is being served at Jahanara to your left when you exit. of customers, the latest in technology, and pioneering innovation to put the very best investment choices at your fingertips, anywhere, anytime. ICICIDirect.com. Leadership at work. For you. We live in an age of disruption, where breaking the rules means building them. Where rebels are the new heroes. Where the game changes every day. CNBC TV 18 Young Turks Conclave 2015 celebrates the disruptors who are pushing boundaries, breaking the mold, and changing the way we do business with their bold new strategies. This July in New Delhi. In partnership with Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Titan, your time has come. ICICI Securities and OU Rules. और आज कैसे याद आ गई पुराने वर्ष की? नहीं actually कभी आपको अच्छे से thank you बोलने का चांस ही नहीं मिला. For what? अरे, so when I was quitting, एक सिर्फ पापी ने तो बोला था कि it's the best decision of your life. So? दो साल में खुद की इतनी successful company खड़ी कर दी. How many people can do this, यार? अच्छा तुमको ही CEO ढूंढ रहे थे ना? CEO? हाँ? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, CEO. मिला है कोई? But I never hired a CEO before, so I don't know how. Simple. Meet him and tell him you're the guy for the job. Really? Yeah. Then you're the guy for the job, sir. Hmm. Thank you. 